This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed.
Point of order, Mr. Stelford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Uh, sir, there are conventions and practice around the answering of questions tabled by members of this House. On the 2nd of November, I wrote, I tabled a question to the Minister for Health, asking him which procedures other than cancer or heart operations have been postponed for patients as a consequence of the pandemic. As I say, sir, the question was tabled on the 2nd of November. We are now on the 7th of December. Can you guide me as to how I can get a timely answer to a very important question from a government minister? Thank you, Mr. Stafford. Well, look, you are aware that I have limited authority to address these matters. Um, it is a question for standing orders that ministers should respond to, to uh, queries and letters from all members, so, and all ministers are accountable to members. So, uh, you have made your point on the record, dare I say, and uh, there are other opportunities for yourself to follow that up through other forms of questions and so on. So, you have made, members made this point, and uh, I would always encourage ministers to respond uh, in a timely manner to all members' questions at all times. Thank you. Point of order, Mr. Gibbon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm looking for your advice to members of this House as to how uh, we can seek responses and what the protocol is in light of the Justice Minister's decision to not just register an interest uh, around a policy issue, but to then recuse herself from that policy responsibility, which now has been delegated to the Permanent Secretary to take key policy decisions, uh, which is unprecedented in Northern Ireland's devolved history. This has never happened before. What are the protocols going forward for members of this House in seeking responses on this issue, uh, particularly in light of the fact that the Permanent Secretary does not have speaking rights in this Assembly to deal with what is a very serious issue? Well, the member will be aware, I haven't had an opportunity to really look at this, and I don't know much of the background to it, but what I do know is this, is that all ministers are responsible and accountable to the House for matters within the remit of their department. So whether they have a delegated authority to a particular servant or civil servant, as you'd say, or official, to take certain matters forward, the Minister is still accountable to the House and will always remain so. Okay, I hope that satisfies the member. Okay. Um, I have received notice from the Minister of Justice that she wishes to make a statement. And before I call the Minister, uh, can I remind members that in light of social distancing been observed by the parties, the Speaker's ruling that members must be in the chamber to hear a statement if they wish to ask a question has been relaxed. Members do still have to make their name, make sure that their name is on the speaking list if they wish to be called, but they can do this by rising in their places as well as notifying the business office or the Speaker's table directly. I remind members to be concise, please, in asking their questions. Uh, I would also remind members that in accordance with long established procedure, points of order will not be normally taken during the statement or the question period thereafter. I call on the Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And with permission, I wish to make a statement regarding a bilateral meeting under the auspices of the Intergovernmental Agreement on Cooperation on Criminal Justice Matters, held virtually on Friday, the 27th of November 2020. This was my first such meeting with Helen McEntee, TD, the Minister of Justice, at which I represented the Executive. I intend to continue the practice introduced by former Justice Minister David Ford of making periodic statements to keep this Assembly informed of meeting held, meetings held under the auspices of the agreement. The Intergovernmental Agreement on Cooperation on Criminal Justice Matters provides the framework for North-South cooperation in this area. It provides for meetings between the Justice Ministers, North and South. Such engagement is very important. To a large extent, we share the same justice problems, issues and concerns. This was the first IGA ministerial meeting to have taken place since November 2016. This long gap came about as a consequence of the period of the Assembly's inactivity and the recent Irish general elections. The re-establishment of the ministerial meetings is particularly timely given the known impacts the coronavirus pandemic has had on justice systems and the as yet unknown consequences that will flow from Brexit. It's an extremely useful forum to maintain relationships with our counterparts in Ireland across a wide range of justice issues. The IGA joint work provides a focus for the work of joint work on justice issues related to the management of offenders, the support for victims, uh, knowledge and exchange between our forensic services, uh, engagement on youth justice developments and policing of diverse communities. 
Five Point Project advisory groups uh, have been providing the mechanism by which the work in each of these areas is taken forward. In spite of the hiatus in the publication of a work programme, Minister McEntee and I were impressed by the progress that has been made in these areas since the last IGA meeting. A work programme is normally prepared and published annually under the auspices of the IGA. This requires ministerial sign-off, and I am pleased to announce today that a new work programme has been prepared under the terms of the IGA for 2020-21. This was signed off jointly by me and Minister McEntee at the IGA ministerial meeting. I have spoken often about the importance of working together across the justice system, the executive and the voluntary community sector to implement the recommendations of the Gillen report in a way that delivers the reform envisaged. I therefore particularly welcomed the opportunity at the IGA meeting to share the progress that we are making against implementation of the Gillen Review, highlighting some of the current key initiatives that will help to transform and improve the experience of victims and witnesses. These initiatives include the introduction of the Committal Reform Bill to this Assembly on 3 November, which will help to reduce delay and the time taken to deal with serious sexual offences cases by removing the use of oral evidence as part of the committal process. It will also avoid vulnerable victims having to give oral evidence and be cross-examined more than once in the process. In addition, the bill will also introduce new arrangements whereby relevant cases can bypass the committal process entirely, thus ensuring those cases are transferred to the Crown Court at an earlier stage. I also updated Minister McEntee on the establishment of a new pilot scheme that will provide publicly funded, independent legal advice to adult complainants in serious sexual offence cases. The service will be available from the point that a crime is reported up until the commencement of the trial. I recognise that the criminal justice processes themselves can be traumatic for complainants in these cases. I am confident that this new initiative, which should be operational by 1 April next year, will help to support complainants as their cases progress and increase their confidence in the criminal justice system. We also discussed work my department is taking forward on providing remote evidence facilities in Belfast and Craigavon. I expect these facilities to be operational within weeks, enabling vulnerable adult and child victims and witnesses to provide their evidence to the court remotely. This is an important step forward, which will again improve the experience of complainants and vulnerable witnesses. It will minimise the likelihood of them being re-traumatised by having to meet the accused or give evidence in a daunting courtroom environment at what is undoubtedly a traumatic and distressing time in their lives. Minister McEntee and I agreed on continuing collaboration and a work programme at official level aimed at promoting shared learning in respect of support for victims. So many of the issues and challenges relating to victims and witnesses are mirrored across our two jurisdictions. In each jurisdiction, we face challenges around supporting victims and witnesses within the criminal justice system, around providing timely and accurate information to victims relevant to their case, and around ensuring that victims and witnesses are consistently able to access their entitlements under their respective charters. There is clearly much merit in continued cross-border cooperation on these issues, and I welcome the ongoing commitment to close cooperation through the Support for Victims Programme Advisory Group. We also discussed the impact of domestic violence and the exacerbation of incidents of domestic violence that have arisen during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is something that both ministers and the two police services see as a priority area of work. We expect some further areas of shared work to develop in this area following the introduction of the Domestic Abuse Bill here in Northern Ireland. I have attached a copy of the 2020-21 Work Program, program which was agreed at our meeting on the 27th of November to the printed version of the statement. It will also be published in the relevant departmental websites following this statement. In relation to Brexit, we had an important discussion on the, on the challenges faced by justice organisations um, in both jurisdictions. As ministers, we are committed to ensuring that we maintain and build on good cross-border cooperation that already exists, as well as sharing standards, practices and procedures in areas such as operational engagement, forensics and data exchange. It is critical that these important areas of joint work can continue as we approach the end of the transition period following exit from the European Union. I also wish to provide members with an update on the Joint Agency Task Force, JAFT, which was instituted under the Fresh Start Agreement and is led by senior officers from the Police Service of Northern Ireland and Garda Shikana, um, the Revenue Commissioners and HM Revenue and Customs. A number of other organisations, including the National Crime Agency and the Irish Criminal Assets Bureau, are also involved in operational activity. 
This is overseen by a strategic oversight group and an operations coordination group. An initial, an initial six priority areas of action were agreed. These are rural crime, child sexual exploitation, financial crime, illicit drugs, excise fraud, human trafficking. Task Force has advanced our cross-border operational response. At the meeting, we received a copy of the latest six monthly report to the JATF to September 2020. In spite of the coronavirus pandemic, cross-border investigations have continued across a number of crime types, including burglary, armed robbery, hijacking, ATM thefts, livestock thefts, and cruelty to animals. Human trafficking remains a concern in both jurisdictions. A number of cross-border investigations remain active, with potential victims having been identified. The PSNI Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking Unit and Angarda Shikana Human Trafficking Investigation and Coordinations Unit recorded 76 persons who have presented during the period as potential victims of human trafficking in Ireland and Northern Ireland. During this reporting period, the coronavirus pandemic has negatively affected organised crime groups in, their, in terms of their illicit production facilities due to international restrictions on the movement of people. However, this is assessed as a temporary effect and illicit production remains a significant threat. There are currently a number of cross-border excise fraud investigations that are being pursued by the authorities on both sides of the border. There are a total of 15 financial crime investigations ongoing under the auspices of the cross-border JATF. The investigations are being conducted by the PSNI and Garda Shikana, CAB and the NCA, supported by HMRC, the Revenue Commissioners, and incorporate a range of criminal offending, including drug trafficking, cigarette smuggling, modern slavery, modern slavery and human trafficking, theft and fraud. In addition to criminal investigation powers, non-conviction-based asset recovery powers are also being utilised in both jurisdictions to disrupt OCGs and recover the proceeds of crime. This reporting period witnessed three large law enforcement agency interventions on both sides of the RAC, resulting in approximately um, 9.7 million euro of drugs being seized. Minister McEntee and I will take receipt of the formal six-month update from the Joint Agency Task Force at our next meeting, um, and I look forward to be able to report on further success of the task force to this Assembly in May. In conclusion, I am committed to maintaining our excellent criminal justice cooperation with Ireland between our respective law enforcement agencies. The strong levels of engagement between our respective criminal justice agencies is all the more important as Brexit negotiations reach a conclusion and we begin our exit from the European Union structures. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And I call Paul Gibbon, the Committee for Justice Chairperson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for this statement and coming before the House uh, to provide it. Uh, long before Brexit, uh, there has been a crime bonanza on the border, exploited by criminal organisations, paramilitary organisations, and a lot of these issues uh, the Minister has referred to have, have taken place for many years. In the discussions with her counterpart in the Republic of Ireland, uh, what uh, measures are going to be taken that uh, post-Brexit uh, there will be a serious level of engagement to tackle the criminality that has existed for many years at the border? Mr Speaker, um, the Chair of the Committee is of course correct that there has been a history um, of criminality on both sides of the border and I think that is true in almost all um, border communities right across um, the globe because people will work to exploit those differences um, at the interface um, in order to be able to continue uh, with their criminal activity. It will be of course a matter um, for the future security partnership if such a security partnership can be agreed in order to ensure that we maintain the kind of streamlined and effective and efficient uh, working that we currently have on a cross-border basis. However, I am reassured that the work that has been done by my department and by the Department um, of Justice um, in the Republic of Ireland um, is building upon the good cooperation and collaboration that we have. And through the Joint Agency Task Force, I think that there is a real opportunity to bring together um, both um, revenue and customs um, interventions, as well as criminal justice interventions, to ensure that we are able to actively um, and cooperatively deal uh, with cross-border crime. Can I call Linda Dillon? Gormayogut, can I thank the Minister for her statement today and appreciate some of the issues outlined. 
I suppose just for future, it might be beneficial for us to get a wee bit more information about what's coming from the other side. So, so what's been said by the Justice Minister in, in the 26 counties in relation to what updates they're giving us. But could the Minister give me some more detail in relation to the new pilot scheme and the legal advice for adult complainants in serious sexual offences, cases including how many complainants might have access to that and where it will be based and how long it will run for? Um, with respect to that, I'm happy to write to the, uh, to the member with further details. In respect of my statement, obviously it is about my engagement with Minister McEntee. She will also be making um, a comparable statement um, to the doll in due course. I call to Lord Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, welcome uh, the Minister's uh, positive engagement with her counterpart in the South, and indeed, in particular, the uh, issues around sexual and domestic violence. But I think it's very worrying in the week that's in it and the day that's in it, Mr. Speaker, that we uh, examine a wee bit more closely uh, the operational engagement, forensics, and data exchange in the absence of the uh, agreements that are uh, going to be lost to us whenever they. Uh, Britain uh, leaves the EU. So, in terms of the data exchange around forensics, fingerprint, DNA, and indeed the European arrest warrant, you know, I know that there's unpre unprecedented cooperation between the PSNI and Garda Síochána, and now the two ministers. So, what gaps and how are they going to be filled in the immediate aftermath of the UK exit? I thank the member for her question. As she will be aware, um, the two main priorities for the Department um, of Justice um, are that we are able to, first of all, um, have an effective and efficient replacement um, for the European arrest warrant, should we not have access to that um, beyond um, our exit from the EU. Um, and the second area, which is our priority, is for data adequacy agreements to be sought. Data adequacy agreements have been sought by other countries, particularly in relation to GDPR, and that has a, so there is a, a, an effective way forward on that. But we will be the first to seek a data adequacy agreement when it comes to justice um, measures, and so it is as yet untested territory. However, both departments have worked closely together in order to ensure that we do have mechanisms, effective mechanisms, um, to continue with our cooperation on a legal basis um, in the interim while those things are done. However, it would be our view that. Should there not be a future security partnership agreed as a result of Brexit, it would be important that the Home Office take forward as a matter of urgency bilateral negotiations under the protocol um, with the Irish Government in order to ensure that all of the various justice measures that may be compromised um, by Brexit can then um, be streamlined and improved through a bilateral agreement. And I call Doug Beatty. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for um, a really useful statement. Uh, and, and if I can ask, and, and uh, apologies if I'm swaying into the operational side of things a little bit, but it's really just her, her view on this, uh, if you can't go into any detail. Um, but as you well know, that a lot of the crime that happens uh, across the border uh, is, is paramilitary organised, and that is financial crime, illicit drugs, excise fraud, even human trafficking. Uh, so can I ask the Minister, um, the, the JATF, how do they coordinate with our own paramilitaries task force um, and, and feed into the action plan on paramilitarism, criminality and organised crime? Well, the member makes a very good point, and as he knows, um, in terms of our own um, paramilitary and organised time, uh, crime task force, um, obviously the PSNI um, are the main coordinating body, and so the work that is done through the JATF um, will also be reflected in terms of paramilitarism more generally. Um, obviously, the Chief Constable would be best placed um, to discuss the operational matters um, in relation to that coordination. However, we also, as the member will be aware, um, we are also doing work in order to enhance our capability when it comes to civil recovery, for example, um, under unexplained wealth order orders. Um, Crim uh, freezing of criminal assets in banks um, and forfeiture orders, because I think all of those will help um, us to uh, fight against organised crime. And as he rightly says, the, the division between organised crime and paramilitarism is often paper thin, if at all. And I call John Blair. I, can I thank the Minister for, for her statement? Uh, Mr Speaker, cross-border cooperation and policing is a crucial matter at all times, of course, but it's particularly so in the context of Brexit uncertainties. The, the Statement and Business uh, Plan work programme provided today refer to cooperation on uh, operational engagement, forensics and data exchange. Can I ask the Minister if similar cooperation is taking place at local level uh, with, for example, neighbourhood teams and district policing teams? 
I thank the member for his question, and that is a consideration um, which we actually discussed um, with both um, the Chief Commissioner, Frank Gardish O'Connor, um, and also um, the Chief Constable um, of the PSNI. And there is very good um, local cooperation um, between, for example, um, community um, policing teams um, in terms of um, area, things that they would be concerned about in terms of community um, community crime, tensions, fear of crime, tackling um, issues, local neighbourhood issues and communities, because I think as we all recognise, people, um, particularly border communities, live cross-border lives, and so the things that impact on people on one side of the border will also be impacting on communities on the adjacent side of the border. And so there is good <clears throat> ongoing working, and we believe that that will be able to continue um, post-exit from the European Union and the transition period, um, through largely through the cooperation um, at local level um, between the various policing teams. We've seen that perhaps um, <clears throat> We've seen that perhaps to a greater degree than usual um, in terms of policing around COVID issues and trying to cooperate um, the use of resources there. But I think it is very important um, that we continue with that on the ground cooperation as well as the high level cooperation uh, which we take forward as ministers in terms of our operational planning. Nicole Gordon, Don. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her statement today. We do welcome the commitment within the Joint Agency Task Force that tackling human trafficking is one of the six priority cases. There is real concern, however, that there has been a very low number of convictions secured for human trafficking offences, with only nine individuals being persecuted for trafficking offences and only four convictions secured. What more can be done to tackle human trafficking in relation to on a cross-border basis? Well, I think that there are a number of things, first of all, that it would be worth um, acknowledging that the JATF are able to do. And previous reports, for example, have indicated a number of areas where collaborative working has been able um, to give added value. There is increased, avail increased availability of law enforcement to target, intercept and seize um, tangible criminal assets, but also to interrupt and disrupt criminal activity, particularly those that would lead to um, that would lead to crime groups having financial incentives for their work, and human trafficking falls within that category because, unfortunately, those involved in human trafficking do not treat people uh, with human dignity, but instead treat them as though they are commodities to be traded. And so, I think it's hugely important. There's also been enhanced identification of organised crime groups that work across the border better communication and stronger relationships between law enforcement both north and south, which is also important. And whilst there has been previously strong cross-border links, the ability to run coordinated operations has a particular value, particularly, I think, with issues like organised crime um, and with human trafficking. Opportunities also for enhanced and streamlined information and intelligence sharing and opportunities for joint training, all of which will impact on the issue um, of human trafficking. I think it has to be said, Mr. Speaker, that those organisations which are engaged in trafficking um, of, any, of anything at all um, as part of their organised crime networks will use those routes in order to traffic drugs, contraband, cigarettes, whatever it might be, and will use them just as readily um, to traffic individuals. And I think we need to be very conscious of that. So I think even just the work that's done um, at local level in terms of creating more vigilance um, and more awareness in local communities has been hugely important in terms of exposing suspicious activity, which can then be reported on either side of the border and escalated so that it can be looked into. Nicole, Emma Rogan. The Minister has noted um, that both Ministers and the two police services see domestic abuse as a priority area of shared work, um, which is welcome. A particular focus should be on those living, working and residing in the wider border regions. Can the Minister outline today some details of her discussions with Minister McEntee about any joint work that was done to tackle domestic abuse during the recent pandemic? Well, first of all, there was quite a lot of work done on both sides of the border in terms of communication, and I think that that was a key, a key aspect of this, because people will listen um, to the media, um, they will access Twitter, they will access um, social media and also mainstream media um, in much the same way, regardless of where um, on which side of the border they live. So the coordination um, of us being able, for example, to bring forward um, more advertising to raise awareness has also been important. Um, as the member may be aware, um, the Republic of Ireland have also had 
the O'Malley um, review um, of uh, domestic abuse and vulnerable witnesses, particularly um, in terms of prosecution of sexual offences. So that work would very much mir mirror the work that was done by Gillen around particularly sexual offences. And it has been good for us, for example, to be able to look at areas where we have been piloting certain, um, certain approaches um, to dealing with vulnerable witnesses and then can feed that through to our counterparts in the South. And there are other areas where they are piloting the issues and we are able to learn from their experience. So I think that that kind of cooperation and collaboration, whether it is in relation to domestic abuse or whether it is in relation um, to sexual offences, is something that we need to build on in the coming weeks and months. I think across this island there are people clearly who are living in fear in their own homes, who are subject to domestic abuse and to violence, and we want that to stop. Um, and it's very clear that there is a coordinated effort from both sides of the border um, to ensure that, first of all, we have the right legislative vehicles in order to ensure that abuse um, is captured, but also that we have the right um, coordination when it comes to training, for example, um, of officers who will be dealing with this in the front line. And I think that is another area where cross-border cooperation could be very helpful. Nicole Robin Newton. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for her uh, statement, an uh, extremely useful statement. I, I note, Minister, that the matter of cruelty to animals uh, was discussed um, with your counterpart. Could I ask the Minister if specifically the uh, cruel practice of puppy farming was indeed uh, discussed? Um, I note that the uh, Mid-Ulster PSNI are running a campaign which they have entitled Pause, P-A-W-S, Pause for Thought, in, in this area. And that they're indicating in that campaign that they believe organised crime groups are involved in, indeed, the uh, puppy farming. Can I just ask if, uh, and indeed the PSNI indicate to me that they're concerned about puppy smuggling across the border. If puppy farming was discussed, perhaps the Minister would let us know, and if it wasn't discussed, would she add it to the next agenda? Mr Speaker, it wasn't particularly focused on in this, in this meeting. Um, we did talk, though, more widely um, about animal cruelty and animal welfare, and um, particularly um, issues around, for example, um, organised crime group involvement um, in either the theft of animals, the smuggling of animals, um, or um, the abuse of animals, um, for example, for things like dog fighting. Um, however, I'm more than happy to add the issue um, of puppy farms and indeed puppy smuggling um, to the list of issues which we talk about because it is clear um, that organised crime groups will diversify into whatever sector they can. And if they have no consideration when it comes to human trafficking, they certainly have no conscience um, when it comes to how they treat animals. I call Gemma Dolan. Okay, um, and I thank the Minister for her statement. And I note and welcome the Department's work on providing remote evidence facilities for vulnerable adults and child victims and witnesses. Would the Minister agree that the Barnhouse model is the gold standard for supporting child victims and witnesses? And can she confirm if there's any work ongoing to introduce such a model here? Um, yes, I'm happy to confirm that we are looking at the Barna House model, and it's something that we would like to see introduced um, in line with the recommendations of the Gillen report. We are building, first of all, in terms of the remote evidence centres, because that's the first bit that we are going to trial and pilot here. Um, those, that will be done in Craigavon and in Belfast um, initially, um, and we will then be able to test um, the effectiveness um, of those operations um, and learn from that, um, from that pilot. Um, and then it would be our intention to look at the wider issues around the Barna House model to see if there are more issues from that that we can bring forward in due course. But I would like to believe that at some point we will be in a situation where we will not have vulnerable victims and witnesses having to give evidence in court at any of our courthouses um, in such uh, sensitive uh, and, inf and, and difficult trials. I call Matthew to Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, thank you for this update. It is, however, mildly perplexing that with just a couple of weeks until the end of the transition period, Brexit has, has just three short paragraphs in this statement. To that end, and given the importance of the issues outlined uh, uh, in relation to the end of the transition period, can the Minister update us on her reasonable worst-case scenario, one that may have been presented to her by officials, for what happens in terms of cross-border law enforcement if there is not a deal by the end of this year? And secondly, can I invite her to make uh, to set out her position today to people who are still considering that no deal is a good outcome for any part of the United Kingdom. Can I offer her the opportunity now to make her position clear and that of the Northern Ireland Executive to people who are still toying with that idea? 
Well, I, I thank the member um, for the opportunity to do so. Um, I wouldn't wish people to think because it's three short paragraphs in my statement um, that it didn't um, get sufficient attention at the meeting. I can assure the member it certainly did. Um, there has been a lot of preparatory work done, that's the first thing I want to say, with my own department um, and with the Department for Justice um, in the South. So there's been a lot of preparatory work done in terms of how we can reinforce um, our cooperation, how we can ensure um, that we're able to continue with joint operations and indeed how we can ensure that we're able to continue to share data on a legal footing because of course goodwill is not enough um, when it comes to, to Brexit. However, it's clear um, that there would be significant obstacles um, presented to us in terms of both delay um, and cost were we not to have um, a fully agreed future security partnership. And as we know, that future security partnership is, is, in, is um, inextricably linked to having a wider agreement. I have no difficulty in saying that I believe that to leave the European Union without an agreement um, would be an act of folly and recklessness. It would do harm not just to the economy but to the justice system um, and it would, it would inhibit our ability to cooperate. It is important um, for people to recognise that many of the fallback positions which we will take um, as a safety net position when we exit the European Union, if we were to do so without a future security partnership, would leave us reliant on protocols um, and on conventions that were agreed in the 1950s. Um, and I have to say it's difficult to fight uh, 2020 crime uh, with the tools available in the 1950s. Those tools are still operational, they are still effective, um, and they would still be able, for example, to um, allow us to extradite people. But the length of time which it would take to do so would multiply greatly. And we know that one of the key indicators um, that we are looking at trying to address um, in the Department of Justice is to deal with delay in the court system. And it seems to me utterly bizarre that we would introduce potentially an additional two to three years in extradition terms, um, during which time we have to remember that there could be victims and witnesses um, who are waiting um, for trial to take place. So I think on all of those um, scores, we will do our best to work within the structures that are available to us to keep people safe um, and to protect the local community but no one should be under any illusions that the loss of capacity that could result um, if we don't get agreements around things like access to the European arrest warrant um, through the future security partnership, access to the databases such as PROM and ECRIS um, as, as that we would otherwise lose and indeed um, if we don't get access to a data adequacy agreement we'd have a direct um, implication um, for the administration of justice, which would be, I think, mainly in cost terms and in time terms, though we may be able to work at a slower pace um, in some areas. Certainly, um, the PSNI and Angarda Shikana have done a huge amount of work um, in order to ensure that, as far as is possible, they will be able, under existing ar arrangements um, and future arrangements, to be able to continue to share data as far as possible. But you'll understand um, that until we have clarity about what is expected, it is very difficult to give people the reassurance that they would rightly seek on these issues. Paul, Paul Frew. Speaker, uh, due to the Papani arrangements, which is the management of sexual offenders, there has always been concerns and blind spots when an offender travels across the border multiple times. Um, can the Minister, and nothing to do with Brexit of course, it's just always been a concern and a problem, can the Minister enlighten this House to the improvements that have been made over the last number of years on the management of sex offenders between two jurisdictions? I thank the member for his question. Um, as he will be aware, there was also um, last week a meeting of um, the various um, public protection um, agencies, including Probation Board and the Probation Service. Um, and I was able and very pleased to attend that meeting um, that we had prior to my meeting with um, Minister McEntee under the IGA. The PPAG carries out its work in a very positive and progressive and professional manner, with representatives from probation, police, prisons and justice departments in Northern Ireland and Ireland. Staff training and development opportunities are being explored across the justice agencies on a cross-border basis, and currently Papani um, related training in respect of domestic violence and sexual offenders is being progressed and developed. The annual um, PPAG seminar is now in its 11th year, so there has been considerable work done in that time. The theme for this year is Emerging Needs North-South, Developing Criminal Justice Practice, and it was hosted by colleagues in the South via virtual platform on the 27th of November, and we were both present at that event. I have to say I was very encouraged by the level of cooperation on a cross-border basis um, between all of the agencies, and I think it's absolutely 
absolutely crucial, as the member rightly says, um, that we're able to continue to share data, continue to share evidence, continue to share intelligence in order that we keep people safe in their communities. I call Liz Kimmins. And leads on from, from the last member's question in relation to um, sexual violence and, and the impacts across both jurisdictions. Based on, on what you've said, Minister, would you then commit to the development of an all-island strategy in terms of tackling sexual violence, um, mainly for the, the points that have been outlined? Thank you. Well, I think close coordination and cooperation is very important. From our perspective, certainly um, in Northern Ireland um, and in the Republic, there, we are at different stages in terms of the rollout of our various um, strategies. But what we do try to do is keep pace with each other. And I certainly would have no objection if it were to bring ad added value um, to us having an additional strategy. However, I think that the working groups that have already been established under the five-strand approach um, to the IGA are, are probably more effective in that they actually drill down at operational level into what cooperation and collaboration we can we can bring about and also actually what learning we can take from each other but I'm happy to talk to the member further if she believes that there are additional value and um, that could be drawn from having a more coordinated approach and I call Mark Durgan a bit I can call you and I thank the minister for her statement the statement heralds a success of law enforcement agency interventions that have seen the seizure of almost 10 million euros worth of drugs, and such seizures are obviously very welcome and reduce the amount of drugs in our communities. But in my opinion, real success should be measured in terms of the arrest and apprehension of big-time drug dealers and the dismantling of drug gangs who continue to flood our communities with dangerous drugs that are ruining lives. Does uh, or would the minister agree? And does the minister know how many arrests were made in relation to these interventions? In relation to the numbers, I don't have those figures, but I'm happy to write to the member um, if we can obtain such figures. Um, they will obviously be held in different formats in different jurisdictions, but I will endeavour to try and get some indication. I agree entirely with the member um, that it is not enough simply to take the drugs out of the community, although that is a huge issue. It is also important to take the drug dealers out of the community and ensure that they face justice. I think that that is um, a task to which all of the partners um, in the JATF are absolutely committed. Um, I think it, part of the strategy is to disrupt criminal gangs so that they no longer can make profit um, from their, their dealing in drugs or indeed in human misery via human trafficking. However, I think that it is quite right that the member says and draws attention to the fact that it would be also very important that those responsible are brought before the courts because unfortunately um, disrupting their activity is often not sufficient to disabuse them of the interest in continuing with it. I call Martina Anderson. Going me August, Ken Colia, uh, Gurum Buikas, uh, Austin Righteous. Uh, Minister, thank you for, for that statement. And Minister, as you know, I would concur with your view that uh, Brexit is folly, reckless and wrong. But just picking up on your answer to uh, a previous uh, member, am I right in, con in understanding what you're saying is that by losing access to EU key justice and security cooperation arrangements, that the North is going to be left with substandard tools to tackle cross-border crime, and that we could become more susceptible to criminality at the end of this Brexit transition period, and there'll be no good Brexit whether there is a deal or no deal. Well, I think the member makes an important point, but I want to reinforce a couple of things. First and foremost, we have worked very hard with the Department of Justice, um, within the Department of Justice and with the Department for Justice in the South to ensure that wherever possible we are able to find alternative means of doing the work that we currently do, because we do not want people to feel unsafe, neither do we want to send a message um, to criminals that life will be any easier um, post the Brexit transition period than it is currently. And it is our intention and it is the intention of all of the agencies involved in cross-border cooperation that that will be the case. There will, however, um, potentially be gaps in the system if we don't have a justice and security partnership fully negotiated between the UK and the EU. Um, that could that could affect our access to um, certain databases of information that are held in the EU. It could affect our access to uh, some of the measures and tools that are available from within the EU. And that would then drive us back to relying on older um, conventions, um, such as the Lugano Convention from 1957. Those conventions work, so I wouldn't want people to think that they don't work. 
but they do take much longer. For example, an, an extradition um, under the Lugano Convention can take many, many more months than a, an extradition under a European arrest warrant. And that multiplication factor has impact both on those who are um, accused of crime and also those who are alleged victims of crime um, in terms of being able to seek justice. It also has a cost implication um, because it is much more onerous um, for us to manage. So there are genuine challenges there. If we don't get a future security partnership agreed as part of the current talks, then we fall into a situation where it would be for the UK government um, to enter into bilateral negotiations with the Irish government to try to find a way forward. We would certainly be lobbying and have been lobbying very strongly with the Home Office and others that that should be the first priority, that the first country they should be knocking on the door of for a bilateral agreement is Ireland because they are by far our largest customer when it comes, um, and the UK's largest customer when it comes um, to issues like extradition um, and when it comes to issues like data sharing. So it would make sense to start with Ireland and work from there rather than start elsewhere and work backwards. So we're very clear that there are a number of routes to get to where we want to be, which is good. Um, co good continued cooperation. However, there are a number of obstacles to be overcome in order to get there. And it is clear to me that there is a huge amount of, of um, energy and expenditure involved in trying to get us to where we want to be. I think that is regrettable when that money could instead and that attention could instead be focused on the job that other members have referred to of actually trying to take criminals out of business. And I call Jim Allister. Thank you. I read in this statement that the intergovernmental agreement proclaims a focus on support for victims. Does that extend to seeking truth for IRA victims who died because the Dublin government assisted in the spawning of the provisional IRA, uh, who, died, uh, who failed to obtain justice because the Dublin government denied extradition for decades? and allowed collusion between the Garda and the provisional IRA. Does any of that interest the Minister enough to oppress her Dublin counterpart for truth and justice for such victims that she should represent? Well, I thank the member for his question, and no, it doesn't extend to that particular issue. It is about support for victims who are currently going through the justice system. Um, who are currently involved um, in cases that are live at the moment um, and supporting them. And of course, there will be some of those who will be legacy cases, and therefore it would extend to some of those cases. However, he asks if it interests me sufficiently that I would be willing to press my Irish counterparts on that. And the answer to that, of course, is yes, because I believe that truth and justice for all victims um, actually matters, and I believe that legacy issues need to be comprehensively dealt with. And I have stood in this place many times, and I can assure the member that wherever collusion may come from, um, whoever may be behind that collusion, wherever the information may come from, whether it requires a public inquiry or whether it requires a legacy, another form of legacy investigation, I am in favour of that happening. And I want to reassure um, the member that as leader of the party, um, but not only as leader of the party as Minister of Justice, that I recognise fully that us not being able to resolve legacy issues is having a toxic effect on our ability to deliver justice in many communities in the here and now. It is polluting our ability in terms of the new start that we have for policing and justice to be able to move forward. And so I believe it is incumbent um, on the British and Irish governments and all of the parties in this chamber to find a comprehensive way forward, whether that be the Stormont House Agreement, which is what we signed up to, or whether that be an alternative proposition that is to be put to us that we have yet to see. It is important and incumbent on all of us to find a way forward that delivers for all victims in terms of truth and justice. It cannot continue to be dealt with in a piecemeal way, in a piecemeal fashion. It is not fair on victims, and they should be at the forefront um, of our consideration in those matters. And that concludes questions on a statement. Members, please take your ease for a moment or two. Thank you.
All right, members. I have received notice from the Minister for Infrastructure that she wishes to, to make a statement. Ida, Minister. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. With your permission, in compliance with Section 52 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, I wish to make a statement regarding the North-South Ministerial Council Inland Waterways Meeting, which was held in the North-South Ministerial Council Joint Secretariat Headquarters in Armagh and by video conference on the 11th of November 2020. The executive was represented by myself as Minister for Infrastructure and by Minister Robin Swan, Minister for Health. The Irish Government was represented by Dara O'Brien, TD, Minister for Housing, Local Government and Heritage, and Minister Malcolm Noonan, TD, Minister of State for Heritage and Electoral Reform. This statement has been agreed with Minister Swan, and I am making it on behalf of both of us. The meeting was chaired by Minister O'Brien and dealt with issues relating to inland waterways and its constituent agency, Waterways Ireland. The following topics were discussed and decisions taken were appropriate. Firstly, we noted the response of Waterways Ireland to the challenges posed by COVID-19. The Council was advised that there had been an increase in user numbers along towpaths and trails during the period of COVID-19 related restrictions and noted the role of Waterways Ireland in leading a user engagement project through the network of inland waterways of Europe to achieve a greater understanding of the increased recreational use of inland waterways since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Council also noted the increasing popularity of the inland waterways as a holiday destination for the domestic market. The Council also noted Waterways Ireland's preparations for Brexit in the context of its status as a north-south implementation body. We noted the comprehensive progress report provided by Waterways Ireland, covering matters including the management and maintenance of waterways, capital expenditure projects and an ongoing programme of replacement of existing and the installation of new jetties and lock gates along the navigations. Ministers also noted plans for blueways developments and restoration work on the Ulster Canal and that Waterways Ireland successfully hosted the World Canals Conference in Athlone in September 2018. In terms of corporate governance, the Council noted Waterways Ireland's annual report and accounts for 2016, 2017 and 2018, which have been led before the Northern Ireland Assembly and both houses of the Oireachtas. We also noted that Waterways Ireland's annual report and draft accounts for 2019 have been submitted to the Comptrollers and Auditors General in both jurisdictions and following certification will be led before the Assembly and both Houses of the Oireachtas. The Council approved Waterways Ireland's corporate plan for 2017-2019 and associated business plans that were prepared in accordance with the guidance issued by the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform and the Department of Finance and recommended the budget provision for each. We noted that Waterways Ireland's 2020-22 corporate plan and 2020 and 2021 business plans have been prepared and following necessary approvals will be submitted to the NSMC for approval before the end of 2020. We also noted the process for the recruitment of the Chief Executive Officer for Waterways Ireland. The Council consented to a number of property disposals and the Council received a progress report on the restoration of the Ulster Canal and the development of the Ulster Canal Greenway. We noted the progress achieved in the restoration of the Ulster Canal, including the completion of Phase 1 of the restoration from Upper Loch Erne to Castle Saunderson the ongoing work and future plans for the restoration from Clonus to Clonflad and the development of the Ulster Canal Greenway. The Council agreed to hold its next NSMC Inland Waterways meeting early in 2021. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And now we move to Michelle McElveen, uh, Chair of the Infrastructure Okay, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister for her statement. And, and while I understand that there's a format for recording these meetings, I suppose it's somewhat disappointing that, given the time that's lapsed 
that has lapsed since the last update, that the work which has been carried out um, um, by Waterways Ireland in the interim that really all we're receiving today is a, a list of noted reports. And, but that said, could the Minister outline the main priorities for Waterways Ireland in Northern Ireland in 2021 and provide details of the properties which the Council has agreed to dispose of and also indicate whether she would be prepared to share the reports with the Committee? I thank the member um, for her question. In terms of the properties that were disposed, um, the, this included a lease agreement for the lease of airspace at Grand Canal Dock for the portion of the cantilevered office development at Waterways House, which extends over Grand Canal Dock. Three separate lease agreements for the lease of airspace at Grand Canal Quay for the redevelopment of Boland Mills, which will encroach into Waterways Ireland's aerospace over Grand Canal Quay, Barrow Street, Dublin, uh, to facilitate the development of a pedestrian boardwalk and 10 residential balconies and two cultural exhibition balconies. A 999-year lease of aerospace at Grand Canal Quay for the development of the Mill 2 Dock Mill Apartment Development, Barrow Street, Dublin, into apartments with balconies and lower deck incorporated. A lease of airspace at Grand Canal Dock for the portion of the cantilevered office development at the Malt House, which extends over Grand Canal Dock an easement of the installation of a polythene pipe at Rathanagan cross the Grand Canal to facilitate storm outfall, a lease for the erection of a pedestrian bridge to service a new railway station at Pelletstown Railway Development, Dublin 15, an easement for the installation of a duct housing, a power cable to provide power to the rail lines at Pelletstown Railway Development, Dublin 15, a 35-year lease for a revised area of land to facilitate the construction of an access gangway and retractable pontoon at Ballyvolane, Mount Shannon Road, Anacotti in County Limerick. A lease to facilitate the continued construction of the Royal Canal Greenway. An easement to facilitate a prescribed right of way to the domestic residents and land at Moy Valley, Enfield in County Kildare an easement to formalise a right of way to access his lands at Bracken Little, Kilbegan and County Offaly, the granting of a 99-year lease and to the sale of an area of ground along the shoreline at Priors Point, Carrick and Shannon in County Leitrim, an easement to facilitate a right of way to a property which they purchased from Watersways Ireland at Clonheen in County Kildare, an easement to formalise a right of way to access his lands in Mullingar in County Westmeath, an easement in respect of a 500 mm diameter and 300 mm diameter rising main under the Grand Canal using an existing 1500 mm culvert as part of the Upper Liffey Valley sewage scheme, an easement for surface water and foul sewer pipes under the Royal Canal at Brannigan's Town, an easement to facilitate access to their property at Skirteen in Offaly County, Kildare, a right-of-way easement to facilitate access to the property at Jigginstown in Nace in County, Kildare, an easement to facilitate access to their property at Rogerstown, in Derry, County Offaly, a 99-year lease for the erection of a road bridge crossing the River Barrow as part of the Athy Distributor Road Scheme, and the granting of a supplemental lease of an area of Shannon Waterway at, in County Roscommon. All of the disposals were in the south of Ireland. None of them were contentious. Some were financially significant, and each property is naturally subject to valuation prior to disposal to ensure best value for money is achieved. In respect of the reports, I am happy to share those with the committee and with members. Good morning, uh, last can call you, and I want to say thank you to the Minister for her statement. Um, Minister, on the issue of waterways, can I ask uh, what plans are there to implement a lifting bridge at Newry Southern Relief Road as well as narrow water to ensure continued access to Newry Canal? Thank you. I thank the member for her question. That specific issue was not uh, discussed um, at our meeting, but the member will know that I have been engaging with local stakeholders on this issue. I most recently uh, met with representatives from all political parties uh, across the council uh, to hear their view on the lifting bridge, uh, and I'm continuing with that focused engagement to ensure that we can get the right project in terms of the Newry Southern Relief Road, but also the member will be aware of my commitment in terms of Narrow Water Bridge. 
Item er Dolores Kelly, Fáinne Cash, I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her statement. And she will be aware that uh, in my own constituency there has been a campaign for the Ulster Canal up, right up to Portadown for many, many years. So I look forward to hearing that in a future statement from the Minister. But uh, the Canal is, of course, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, a commitment within the new decade and new approach. So I just wonder, in terms of the Ulster Canal Greenway, could the Minister provide further update? Yes, I'm of course happy to provide a, an update on the Ulster Canal Greenway. Uh, as the member rightly points out, the Ulster Canal restoration project is a commitment to the new decade, new approach, as is the Ulster Canal Greenway. Um, Waterways Ireland, in collaboration with Monaghan County Council, Armagh City, Banbridge and Craigavon, Borough Council and the East Border Region Limited, took the lead in submitting an application for interreg funding for the project. The application was successful and just under um, €5 million Euro was allocated towards the cost of the Greenway. The Ulster Canal Greenway strategy, devised by Waterways Ireland in collaboration with local authority partners along the Ulster Canal corridor, identified 12 potential Greenway routes, totalling almost 200 kilometres in length, and two of them comprise this project, Smithborough to Monaghan and Monaghan to Middletown. The annual socio-economic value of improved health outcomes from local population access to the 200 kilometres of Greenway for walking and cycling is estimated at £14.4 million. So as we can see, projects with huge and multiple benefits, and it fits into my priorities as well in terms of ensuring that we have a green recovery from COVID. I call Rosemary Barton for a question. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, so far for what you've said in your statement. Minister, um, this is quite a large project. Can you advise me what conversations there's been with the Northern Ireland Tourist Board to try and promote this project here within Northern Ireland? I thank the member um, for a question. Uh, Waterways Ireland is committed to working uh, in partnership with local authorities and working with our tourist representative bodies as well. As you say, the Ulster Canal Greenway and the Ulster Canal in itself are, are projects that will deliver multiple benefits, whether that's physical and mental health, but also in attracting visitors uh, to the local area as well. So hugely important in, in terms of the tourism benefits. Uh, and Waterways Ireland, no doubt, will continue to work with all key partners um, in the delivery of the project. I call Andrew Muir for a question. Thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his statement. Uh, my question is really in the Ulster Canal Greenway. Phase 2 is the Smithborough to Middletown, and it's on course, it says, to, for delivery in 2021. Is the Minister confident that will occur, and is there any timescales for future phases in terms of completing the entire project? I thank the member for his question. Certainly, I haven't received any information um, otherwise in terms of the time frame that has been set out, but I'm happy to um, come back to the minister with further details if that doesn't prove to be correct. I call David Hilditch for a question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your statement uh, today. On this, the recruitment for the Chief Executive post, um, could you advise us as that competition began? And if so, when do you feel it will, or when do you know if it will be concluded? Um, the CEO Post and Waterways Ireland became vacant with the departure of the former post holder. Um, as a result of the absence of the NSMC at that time, a successor could not be appointed. So the post was filled on an interim basis and with a fixed term contract. I can confirm to the member that a recruitment competition was launched on the 23rd of October by the Public Appointments Service and the closing date was the 12th of November. Following the normal process of shortlisting and interviewing, the successful candidate will be appointed by the NSMC. I welcome the Minister's statement today, and I do welcome the Minister's announcement in relation to the Middletown section. Um, th there is question marks over whether it's Middletown and Monaghan and then on to Smithborough. Um, did that discussion come up on the day, Minister, that that's the whole route? And also, will she give a commitment to work with local councils? to uh, get that project on the way as soon as possible, because this is a big game changer for Middletown, big opportunities in terms of promotion of, of tourism and everything else, and it has certainly helped that we border village. Cormill Moggett. 
true that it is a game changer and there are huge benefits. My understanding is, as he has set out in terms of the route, but I'm happy to provide further detail to the member um, as, we, as we move this project forward. Call Keith Buchanan for a question. Thank you. Thank the Minister so far for her answers. Minister, relating to here in Northern Ireland, I've got a rundown of every culvert and pipe in, the, in, in all that counties throughout Ireland, and I uh, appreciate the work that's going on down there. But here in Northern Ireland, can you confirm what the priorities are for Waterway Ireland in 2021 and further beyond? Yep. Um, well, Waterways Ireland is obviously um, about ensuring that we maximise our blue infrastructure. Um, the member will be aware, and particularly through COVID, we have seen a huge increase uh, in the number of people who are accessing uh, our local heritage and our local blue and green infrastructure. So it's about ensuring that that's safe. But it's also about making sure that we're able to invest in that infrastructure so that we grow it. I mean, one of the things that we have seen through COVID is a huge increase in the number of visitors, the number of people who are facilitating and using this infrastructure as part of their staycation. Certainly this is something that I would like to see us build on and I know that it's something that um, Waterways Ireland are committed to. They've been engaging across Europe and also looking at international best practice as well to ensure that we are able to showcase our blue infrastructure, our, our navigations, our canals uh, in a way that ensures maximum benefits in terms of health and well-being but also for tourism, for people who live here but also when we get to the place where we're able to open up again and invite people from around the world to come and see the many assets that we have. Here, Mayor Martina Anderson for your cash. I call Martina Anderson for questions. Well, I will ask Ken Colia and Goran Brekas, as in righteous, I thank the Minister for her statement. And Minister, you said in the statement that you discussed the status of Waterways Ireland, um, but given that the North will lose the EU oversight, um, perhaps by the end of today. Uh, did the North South Ministerial Council discuss rela uh, issues relating to improving and maintaining the water quality of Waterways Ireland uh, to protect that from further environmental harm? As we know, there'll be no good Brexit uh, for the North of Ireland. I thank the member for her question. Um, it's absolutely clear that there should be no reduction uh, in any of our environmental um, standards. Um, when we were speaking uh, about uh, Brexit, um, we were examining the preparations that Waterways Ireland has undertaken for the period or for the end of the transition period. Uh, we also talked about the impact that it may have, and while there is no possible outcome that will impact solely on Waterways Ireland from Brexit, there are various outcomes that will impact on the organisation. EU directives will no longer apply to GBNNI, and this may lead to an incremental dis divergence in legislation between the two jurisdictions with the passage of time. Uh, GBNNI will not have to comply with the EU procurement directives, and so that may see rules changed. Uh, in the short term, following the exit, our rules are likely to remain the same. However, they may change in the medium term. The additional procurement regime will bring added administration. Uh, and Waterways Ireland has considered the implication of the need to migrate to a new tender advertising portal and platform. As a member has highlighted, the EU funding will no longer be available in the North, with the exception of Peace Plus, which the EU has committed to continuing uh, to continue allocating. And of course, any changes to the common travel area arrangements would impact on Waterways Ireland staff, whose area of work covers both jurisdictions as well as on users of the navigations, particularly the Shannon Urn Waterway, which runs through counties Leitrim, Cavan, and Fermanagh. So, just to assure the member, these issues were discussed. Here, Mayor Pat Catney for Hunya Kesh. I call Pat Catney for. Uh, thank you, Minister. Thanks for your statement so far, uh, Minister. I, I, I live right on the towpath, and it's a real asset to us. I was on it yesterday in my new electric bike, which you also made legal. I would like to ask the Minister. Uh, I know that the increase in the capital budget provided to Waterways Ireland. Can the Minister tell us more about why this increase was provided? thank the member for his question and it's great to see that he and hear that he's embracing the active travel agenda literally on his e-bike. Um, Waterways Ireland has a statutory duty to manage, maintain, develop and promote the navigations for which it is responsible, mainly for recreational purposes. In order to fulfil the statutory duty, the navigational infrastructure must be fit for purpose, meet health and safety requirements and also meet customer expectations. Severe weather events, particularly the more frequent incidences of flooding in recent years, as well as ongoing usage, causes deterioration of infrastructure. 
DFI capital allocations to Waterways Ireland are invested in repairing damage to the infrastructure, replacing jetties, moorings and other facilities that are beyond repair, and providing additional facilities to accommodate the increasing number of users on Loch Erne and the Lower Ban. Specifically, in the years 2017 to 2020, Waterways Ireland has delivered on a number of capital projects on the Loch Erne and on the Lower Ban. Tomb Lockhouse was refurbished and opened as a Waterways Heritage Centre and Cafe, operated by Tombridge Industrial Development Amenities and Leisure, a local community association. Existing jetties were replaced, some with floating jetties, at six sites on Loch Erne. Access ramps were also replaced where necessary. A leakage was repaired at Portnell Lock and the swing bridge was repaired and an automated lifting device was installed at Portna. Uh, work will commence on the rehabilitation of Carn Row Weir in spring 2021 and the anticipated completion date is autumn 2022. I think it's important to also note that Waterways Ireland has reported an increase of 3,288 boat registrations since 2016, which demonstrates the increasing popularity of our inland waterways. I'll call Roy Beggs for a question. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her statement. It refers to the draft accounts for 2019, which are not as of yet completed. Now, that's some 11 months after the accounts has closed, and it's helpful in accounting for public money to have timely reporting. So my question to the Minister is, given that Waterways Ireland doesn't have a board, who can we be held account for this late finalisation of the accounts and the expenditure of public money? Well, the issue in relation to the accounts um, is a matter that the Minister for Finance here ha had cleared. Uh, the Minister uh, Finance in the South didn't have time to clear it in advance of the meeting. I understand that those have now been cleared, and so those accounts will be laid uh, in the Assembly and also um, in the Houses of the Oireachtas as well. In respect of the issue of there being no board, the Member will know that the North-South bodies were established under the North-South um, Cooperation Implementation Bodies NI Order. 1999, and two of the six bodies were established without the requirement under the legislation to have a board. One of these is Waterways Ireland. At the NSMC plenary meeting on the 15th of June 2012, ministers endorsed the St Andrews Review recommendation that sponsor departments should consider options regarding the setting up of a board to direct Waterways Ireland's affairs. An options paper was presented to ministers for their consideration at the North-South Ministerial Council meeting on the 19th of June 2013. I'm advised that ministers agree that the existing governance arrangement should be strengthened, but that there is no requirement for the appointment of a board at this time. To assure the member, steps have been taken since to strengthen the governance arrangements. An annual service level agreement has been put in place between Waterways Ireland and sponsor departments and Waterways Ireland provides biannual assurance statements to sponsor departments. Here, Mayor Philip McGuigan for your cash. I call Philip McGuigan for the question. Mayor uh, last can call you. And like everybody else, Minister, I welcome the announcement and the information on the Ulster Canal Greenways. I'm a bit jealous of Pat. Uh, I mean, getting out on his bike yesterday, the, the rural roads of North Antrim were very frosty yesterday, but that's, that's a, an issue for a, another day, Minister, in terms of rural gritting. Can I ask uh, the Minister for an update on the Ulster Canal restoration works itself, and particularly phase two of the project, and when the restoration of the canal to Cl Clonus is estimated to be built? Thank the member for his question. Um, it, as a member will know, in 2007, the Irish government gave a commitment to fund the total cost uh, of restoration of the Ulster Canal from Loch Erne to Clonus. In that same year, Waterways Ireland was given NSMC approval to explore the possible restoration of the Ulster Canal from Loch Erne to Clonus. Phase one, restoration of the stretch from Loch Erne to Castle Saunderson was completed in spring 2019 and is now open for navigation. Phase two, restoration of the stretch from Clonus to Clomfad is currently underway. A commission to investigate a source of a sustainable water supply for the marina has been completed. Waterways Ireland is satisfied that a suitable supply has been sourced in order to facilitate the development. Creative design is also ongoing to develop a vision for the canal within Clonus. Work relating to land requirements and purchase arrangements for this section of the restoration has also commenced. 
And then if I could meet, briefly mention phase three, uh, work will commence on the restoration of the stretch from Castle Saunderson to Crom Fad when phase two is complete. And, and all three phases of the project have been funded by the Irish government. Here, Mayor Daniel McCrossan for New Cash. I call Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And before I ask the Minister a question, I'm wondering will Pat Catney bring his e-bike to Stormont and give us a demonstration, get up and down the mile uh, a few times? Uh, Minister, thank you for uh, that statement. It's very, very useful. And uh, thank you also for your huge efforts over the course of the last uh, number of months throughout this pandemic in supporting our communities. I know that COVID-19 has had a particular impact uh, on services. Uh, can the Minister tell us what impact uh, did the restrictions have on Waterways Ireland? I thank the Member for his question. And um, this actually points to something very positive during the pandemic, uh, where countermetrics are available. Comparisons with the 2019 figures showed a 110 percentage increase in user numbers on towpaths and trails along the navigations in the period from March to August 2020. Where counter metrics are not available, feedback from local government and community partners indicated an unprecedented increase in user numbers, many of whom were using the facilities for the first time. During August, all boat hire companies reported 100% booking solely from the domestic market as the inland waterways became a popular option for staycations. In previous years, the domestic market would have accounted for on average 22% of the boat hire business. Bookings for September and October were at 80 to 90% again from the domestic market. Uh, and it is important that we build on this momentum and success. I've talked a number of times about the quiet revolution uh, during COVID, um, where people are engaging with nature again, where they are being more active in terms of their lifestyle, um, and where they are getting a renewed appreciation uh, for their shared home place. I'm really pleased that Waterways Ireland uh, has been part of the delivery of this, and that it will continue to build on this success and the positive feedback uh, from visitors and local communities, um, because I believe that we have a real opportunity here to make our inland waterways a more integral part of our local community as we build our green recovery in the post-pandemic era. I call Jim Allister for a question. Thank you. I want to return to the question of openness and transparency in regard to Waterways Ireland. You've told us it is no board. That means there are no minutes that any member of the public can ever read. In fact, when my office phoned them to ascertain how one could follow the work of Waterways Ireland, we were told, read our annual report, read our annual report. The 2016 report has just been published this year. We're at the ridiculous situation where even the chair of the committee has to come to this House to ask what projects are underway. How is a member of the public ever meant to follow the work of Waterways Ireland as it spends our public money? If there are no minutes, no accountability, no oversight for the, what the members of the public can follow, isn't it a farcical situation? Thank the member for his question. Uh, Waterways Ireland is accountable to the Department for Infrastructure, the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage, and to the North South Ministerial Council. Ministers discharge their oversight responsibilities in respect of Waterways Ireland through the NSMC. This includes consideration and agreement of the budget and corporate and business plans and progress towards agreed business targets and project milestones. Quarterly monitoring meetings are also held, chaired by senior civil servants from DFI and DHLGH. The Chief Executive Officer and appropriate directors attend to account for business performance and corporate governance. Waterways Ireland's Audit Committee meets quarterly. The committee has an independent chair and two external members and has unrestricted access to the internal and external auditors. The committee has access to the work of internal audit, approves the internal audit work plan and receives reports on various aspects of internal control. That concludes questions on the statement and members just take their ease while we move to the next item of business.
Members, um, continuing with our business, the first item in the order paper is a motion to affirm a statutory rule. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. That the administration of estates, small payments, increase of limit order, Northern Ireland 2020 be affirmed. Thank you. I just initiate him, sir, and I agree. Lation ruin the Minister for Finance to move the motion. Moved, Lascan Corlett. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate, and please open debate on the motion, Ida Lidahal. The purpose of this legislation is to raise the limit on the amount of property which certain organisations are permitted to distribute on the death of a member without the necessity for probate or other proof of title, or where the deceased has nominated a specific beneficiary. The Administration of Estates Small Payments Act, NI 1967, is the relevant legislation that falls within the remit of my department. The legislation applies to certain payments made by industrial and provident societies, credit unions, trade unions, local councils and government departments. It allows the organisation to release money to a nominee or beneficiary up to a fixed value to which the deceased or the deceased's personal representative were entitled without that nominee or beneficiary having to prove title or seek a grant of probate through the probate office. The primary legislation vests the power to make this order within my department, but the, as this legislation relates to bodies associated with several other departments, executive colleagues have been consulted and have approved the, appro the proposed increase in limit. The limit was originally set at £500 in 1967. It has been reviewed and increased a number of times since, most recently in 2004, when the limit was raised to the current figure of £10,000. Sixteen years have passed since the last review, and a recent short and targeted consultation has revealed that the existing limit is posing problems for affected parties. It is now much more frequent for amounts a little over £10,000 to be left by a deceased person, meaning beneficiaries need to seek a grant of probate. This adds costs, which takes away from the amount of the estate left to distribute. For those with minimal resources, these additional costs can be significant and can delay access to the estate at the most difficult of times, not least now in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic. In some cases, beneficiaries may have to forego receiving the whole amount to which they are entitled because the cost of obtaining a grant of probate would be greater than the amount in excess of the 10000 that is available. I consider that raising the small payment sum will assist with some of the difficulties that beneficiaries may experience in relation to the deceased's estate. It will result in a quicker and more efficient process in the payment of money to nominated persons or beneficiaries. Having had this opportunity to consider these issues, I consider that raising the sum to £20,000 is proportionate and takes account of inflation and the concerns which have been raised by stakeholders. Article 2 of the present order, which revokes the 2004 order, therefore increases the small payment limit to £20,000, and by virtue of section 6.2 of the 1967 Act. This order applies in relation to deaths occurring or nominations affected after the expiration of a period of one month, beginning with the date on which the order comes into operation. Members, this is a short and technical yet important piece of legislation which will assist many people during difficult times. I therefore recommend that the administration of a state's small payments increase of limit order Northern Ireland 2020 be affirmed. I now call the chairperson of the Committee for Finance, Dr Steve Aiken. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak as the chair of the Committee for Finance. Uh, the committee considered the policy, the policy proposals for the administration of a state's small payments increase of limit order 2020 at its meeting on the 21st of October. The committee considered the benefits of increasing the limit on the amount of money that may be released to the beneficiaries of a deceased person from that person's estate by certain organisations without the need for a grant of probate. I would like to put on record and take the opportunity to thank the Irish League of Credit Unions for responding to the department, to, to department's consultation, indeed the only organisation to do so. The ILCU response outlined the difficulties caused by the current limit of £10,000, where credit unions have required deceased members' families to apply for grants of probate or letters of administration from the court. Such decisions can be difficult for recently bereaved next of kin or personal representatives because the cost of obtaining a grant of probate can often exceed the remaining estate. The committee noted that the increase in the limit to £20,000 will enable payments to be made directly to the nominated person 
without partial payments being made in lieu of waiting for a court-answered grant of probate for the remaining monies. I would also like to thank Mr McHugh, uh, MLA, a member of our committee, for his assistance in helping the committee come to its decision on this SL, and indeed with his wide experience of the credit union movement, which helped the, part of the committee uh, in its deliberations. The committee considered the statutory rule at its meeting on the 2nd of December and agreed that the rule be affirmed by the Assembly. Finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity to put on the record the committee's sincere appreciation of the work that credit unions do, much of it on a wholly voluntary basis, in providing responsible and affordable financial services at a local level for the benefit of their, me of their members and communities they serve. I commend the motion to the House. I call Paul Free. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I rise to support this move also. I think it's common sense, and having looked through all the evidence in the committee itself, uh, I am satisfied that this is the right thing to do. It seems to be a progression with regards to inflation throughout the years, and in most decades this has been amended. Uh, so I think it's common sense. I think it's right and proper. Uh, at, a, at a time when, when someone passes on, uh, their affairs can be sometimes tricky, and of course you have grieving families in amongst it all and persons. So this will allow a good bit of latitude for all of those financial uh, institutions that deal with this type of thing, uh, and so we must welcome it as a party. Thank you very much. Aram Sir Melissa McHugh on Kanche. I call Melissa McHugh. Um, and I speak to say again to in support of this motion come from uh, my experience, just as had been mentioned by the chair of the Finance Committee uh, and Credit Union. I was a founder member of our credit union in Castle Derg, the Mourne Derg Credit Union, uh, in the 1970s, when four of us initially came together to set up credit union to address the needs of our own local people, our local population, and that it not only facilitated them and receiving low interest loans, but also encouraged them to be thrifty and to take responsibility for their own affairs. And that's what credit union itself represents in so many ways. That for people who have built up over a period of time uh, savings, uh, savings that could be in excess of we'll say that five thousand pounds. You might wonder why I mention a figure such as five thousand pounds. There's also a feature of credit union that in the event of death uh, of a member who is under 65 years of age, that their shares are actually doubled and forwarded to the next of kin. So immediately that brings them over that limit of the £10,000. And for many of our credit union members in particular, and I'm not one but surprised that they were the only organisation that actually replied to this consultation because it's in the interest of all of their members. And very, very often they are the people that don't have large savings one way or the other. But it is still their life savings. And in the event of their death, should it be untimely, uh, all the more need why those resources should be available to the families without them having to go to that extent that they're looking for uh, the, 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 what do you call it, the, the probate um, of the estate itself, the grant of probate. <clears throat> Uh, and I do welcome this opportunity to support the motion because it's at a time like that that those people desperately need to be able to access fundings, whether it has to cover the cost of a wake and funeral, maybe even the purchase of a grave, and maybe to, to uh, have a, a, a headstone uh, in memory of the person who would have died. So, uh, again, to you, that this figure, as I say, it's so easy now, it can be surpassed in terms of the £10,000, and it's only been appropriate to have legislation that will accommodate that. I also want to uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome this statement. Although the proposed change to the order is small, the impact of this change should not be understated. Any time there is a death in the family, it is a time when we should come together to grieve, to support each other and to celebrate life. It is not a time to add an added worry of financial difficulty or along with difficult court proceedings. The Assembly has rightly increased the limit of funds that can be released by certain organisations without probate or another proof of title to allow families to cover pressing costs like funeral expenses. However, this last increase was 16 years ago. Not to go too far a point, but the cost of funerals are spiralling, 
and have become a burden on all of those, regardless of the wealth. It is certain sensible for the limit to be increased to allow families a small bit of relief at the most difficult of times. Furthermore, the cost in accessing probate put it out of reach for some of our lower income families. This is not fair and something should be tackled in the wider context of access to our justice system. In addition, the time has taken from apply to the grant of prorate can be lengthy, adding stress and worry to families, as well as creating financial difficulties for beneficiaries as funeral costs, as I have stated earlier, mount up. This situation has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic with access to solicitors to effect probate being incredibly difficult, as well as getting to court proceedings. It should be also noted how stressful it can be going into the courts. This is not a normal activity of a lot of our community, and certainly not a burden we should be allowing at a time of grief. Um, like Mr McHugh, I uh, also I don't know if it's a conflict of interest, but I did say that the finance. I'm a member of the credit union in Lisburn, and as I went outside uh, on Friday morning, I met with um, Atlas Women's Centre across the road from our credit union and the, the crowd of people that were waiting in order to try and get in. So it is a much needed and much welcome within our community. This current limit has had a great impact on the operations of our credit union. I want to thank the credit unions for their support in the increase, as well as the good work they do in general to support our communities at this difficult time. Thank you. I call the Finance Minister to conclude on the debate. I would uh, like to thank the, uh, the Chair of the Committee and the Committee members who have all spoken uh, in uh, this debate and for the support of the Committee and the work that the Committee do did in terms of analysing the proposition before them and the support that they have offered for the change uh, to the legislation. Uh, I would also like to concur with his uh, views and the views that others have expressed in relation to the credit union movement. I am a, a member of credit union myself, uh, and undoubtedly they perform a, a very valuable service, uh, particularly to those people uh, who, who do uh, have, have little, but what, what they have is precious to them, uh, and, and, and of course, in turn, assisting families when bereavement happens. And, and this, the point of this, as members have pointed out, is to ensure that that level uh, of support is available to families and it's, it's timely and correct now that we move to, to change this. Uh, in, as I said last concordia, this is a technical but it's nonetheless a useful change to the law and it will greatly assist those in need in our community with accessing property on the death without the need to seek probate in the circumstances that I have set out. Uh, so consequently I commend the motion to the House. Okay, members, the question now is that the administration of estates Small payments increase of limit order NI 2020 be affirmed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. Uh, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you. And if members just take their ease while we change to the next item of business.
Okay, members, uh, further consideration stage of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, and I call on the Minister of Justice, Mr. Neil Me Long, to move the bill. Minister. Mr. Speaker, it is with regret and disappointment that I beg not to move the further consideration stage of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill today. Members will be aware that good progress has been made through the amendments proposed to the Bill as a result of ongoing and constructive engagement with the Justice Committee to improve a number of provisions in the Bill. As a result of our collective and collaborative efforts, I had intended to bring forward a number of positive amendments to the Bill today. These would have further strengthened how the offence would operate, as well as further detail on potential regulations for the safeguards and protections to be afforded to victims of domestic abuse, including through through new domestic abuse protection notices and orders, which I today launched a consultation on. Unfortunately, however, I now have no choice but to postpone further consideration of the Bill. As having asked the Chair not to move Amendment 15, he refused to give that assurance this morning. There are potentially significant financial ramifications for the Executive from the amendments on legal aid. At the end of last week, I was made aware that Treasury's budget guidance would put the entire cost of doing something that has repercussive implications for other parts of the UK onto the Northern Ireland Bloc Grant. These issues would normally be examined and indeed addressed during policy development and economic appraisal processes for any new policy. However, due to the way the legal aid provisions were added into the Bill via member amendment at consideration stage, that due diligence was not able to be completed, and without it, it is not clear whether legal aid provisions in the Bill and the further amendments that were to be moved at further consideration stage, in particular Amendment 15, which would prevent commencement of the Bill without the legal aid uh, um, issues, um, would have financial repercussions on other legal aid schemes. If they were to do so, the impact on the Executive's budget is potentially catastrophic. This would be RHI on steroids. It is imperative, therefore, that we do not proceed um, unless either Amendment 15 or is, is withdrawn or we have time to investigate this important issue. There are many in this House and outside, including myself, key stakeholders and those affected by domestic abuse that will be disappointed by these developments and our inability to complete the final stage of the Bill before the end of this year, as I intended. However, given the risks posed by the legal aid provisions in the Bill at Amendment 27 and some of the further proposed amendments, in particular Amendment 15 today, I consider it vital that further time is taken to more fully ascertain the consequences and the best way forward. As has been the case to date, I will wish to continue the work with the Committee on Resolution of this matter to ensure that this important legislation can be put on the statute books as soon as possible. I beg not to move. Okay, thank you, uh, the Minister. And further consideration stage of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill has not been moved. Therefore, we will need to move on to the next item of business. I have given some latitude, but and I do understand the Committee is of the view that they were of the view last weekend. So, therefore, um, there will be no movement in that regard. So, uh, given that we have question time as the next item of business, then I would propose to suspend the hearing. Point of order, Mr. Gibbon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is a shameful course of action by the Justice Minister. It is a disgrace what she is doing today in respect of this issue. This was a committee amendment, not a poll given amendment. It is not my position to act unilaterally when the committee has reached a decision, Mr. Speaker. This is an abuse of the democratic process, and caught in the middle of this are victims of domestic abuse, and that is what makes it all the more despicable. The Minister should be moving the further consideration stage. It is for this Assembly to then decide whether or not it votes for amendments that are put forward. But the actions of the Minister today, I think, do not bode well for the way in which she has conducted herself in respect of this piece of legislation. Well, uh, as I said early on uh, to the member, I gave latitude to the Minister, so I gave latitude to the Chair of the Committee uh, in deference to the work that has been ongoing. Members, I take a point of order, but I'm not going to continue this discussion any longer. But I'll take your point of order first of all. Mr. Speaker, could you confirm that the minister does have the right to withdraw and beg not to move, and that there is nothing disorderly or disrespectful in what I have been forced to do today, um, in respect of this bill? 
Well, of course, the members, the minister is in order not to move, and the, motor, the minister did not move, so therefore we're not progressing on to this debate. Look, as I said, Mr. Fury, I'm not going to take any further points of order on the matter because I'm going to close it because, as I said, I let a little, uh, quite a bit of latitude under the circumstance to the minister and likewise to the chair of the committee who had encapsulated the committee's thinking on the matter. Um, it's unfortunate that we have reached this moment, reached this kind of, um, I suppose, predicament that we're in, but we are in it. Uh, and I would commend the members, all of the members' department and the members who have been very, very hard working throughout this complex bill, as was testified to last week by members from right across every single party in the House. So I would hope that in due course then that, that uh, due diligence will return to the debate uh, to try to moder move these matters of what was a very, very important bill to proceed in, in a fair and uh, you know, respectful manner. So again, I say the, the matter is now closed. The, move, the, the, the bill has not been moved today. And the next item of business is question time. Uh, on that matter, I'm not taking a point of order. Well, let me finish this then. Uh, the next item of business is question time, which will commence at 2 p.m. I therefore propose by leave of the Assembly to suspend the sitting until then. the end of the sitting. Um, I'll just suspend that for one second, but Mr. Allister, point of order. Uh, um, Mr. Speaker, last week I asked the Business Committee to list for this afternoon's business the further consideration stage of my private member's bill. Uh, the committee refused to do so, and yet now we arrive at the point where, after question time, there is no business for this House. Why did the business committee not, as a precaution, list a second piece of business so that that bill could have been progressed? Now neither bill is to be progressed. What sort of management is that? Well, I don't know if that's really a point of order or not, but um, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Allister, you've been around this building and this assembly long enough to know that the business committee uh, respectfully uh, schedules the business for the assembly, and you're well aware of that. And they have had to accommodate recently sittings late in the night, early hours of the morning, and they've been trying to juggle the members' time and the, the orderly business of the assembly. And I have taken no issue with the business committee's decisions thus far whatsoever and have every confidence in their ability to continue managing business well. These circumstances today are unexpected. As I've said, I regret these circumstances have arrived at the, in the way in which they have done. Let's hope we can get back to this bill on a respectful manner which actually resolves the outstanding issues uh, so as that the people who are victims of domestic abuse and violence then will uh, be rendered more safe in the future. So the, the item of uh, the, the setting is by leave suspended. Thank you. The Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. 
program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. 
Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. to the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. As you'll be aware, the Minister is not available today, and I'm sure all members join with me in wishing Mr Putz a very speedy recovery. Speaker has received notification from the Minister for the Economy that she will be responding today to questions on Minister Putz's behalf. I call Claire Sugden to ask the first question. Ms Sugden. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Um, can I thank the member for her question and Mr Speaker with your permission just uh, before we start this session uh, I want to say that um, I'm happy to stand in for my colleague but also to inform the House that I was speaking to him this morning he'd had his toast and porridge and was in very good form um, and looking forward to getting out of hospital again uh, but obviously he's had quite a traumatic period over the weekend so we'll um, do our best to answer your questions um, as, as they arise. The department publishes uh, statistical reports that contain the latest average farm gate prices in Northern Ireland. Within each of these reports, average prices are reported for the latest periods, along with comparisons against prices in previous periods. These reports show that average beef, lamb and pig prices during January to September 2020 have been higher than those of the same period for 2019, whereas average milk prices have been 0.9 pence per litre lower. They also show that average prices since September have remained either around or above prices of the previous year for each of the farm uh, products that are reported. Ms. Sogdom. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank you, Minister. And please pass on uh, my uh, best wishes to Minister Putz in, in a speedy recovery. Um, I, I suppose it's quite fortunate that it's the Minister for the Economy um, answering these questions, and if the Principal Deputy Speaker would indulge me, would the Minister for the Economy like to give her assessment of farm gate prices in Northern Ireland, given that agriculture is one of our largest industries in Northern Ireland and underpins our local economy? 
Yes, um, thank you for the question. Um, in many ways, um, agriculture has been an area of policy that I've, I've uh, looked at for many, many years in the European Parliament um, and really have enjoyed meeting with and talking to the sectors right across Northern Ireland. So what we uh, understand uh, from uh, the statistics that are published is that um, milk prices um, have on average um, are a little lower um, and um, although uh, milk prices for September were 1.5.9 pence uh, higher than in September uh, 2018. Um, but the average price across the period that we're talking about is 0.9% uh, lower. And it represents really um, and the, the volatility and even the price is lower than the rest of the United Kingdom. And it represents um, just uh, the, the market uh, and the exposure that uh, Northern Ireland milk prices have, for example, to the commodity market, um, whereas in uh, GB, much, much greater supplies of their milk supply goes into the liquid market and supermarkets, and um, uh, producers can have longer, more stable uh, contracts. Um, in relation to beef prices, um, we understand that beef prices um, um, for the week ending the 21st of November are 13.2% higher than for the same period last year. And that was, uh, is a difference of £150 per finished head uh, of cattle. So that's a significant uplift in beef prices. Um, and in fact, we probably are the third in the EU league table of beef prices as we currently uh, stand. But nevertheless, again, um, from a processing point of view, this is typ typically a low margin um, process um, where um, really um, the issues around competitiveness and productivity are, are hugely important as well. Pig prices have remained uh, much uh, the same. Um, and uh, again, drop cow prices are um, around about or slightly higher than we would have expected. I'm, I'm loath to interrupt the Minister, and um, <laughs> she'll probably give me a kick in for it afterwards, but um, I, I think it's important that we try to stick to two minutes or less. Um, Mr Jim Allister. Um, looking forward, Minister, uh, under the iniquitous protocol, the impact on a overheads and production costs are going to be very adversely affected uh, by reason of feedstuff uh, imports, fertiliser imports. So what is likely to be the consequence for profitability and farm gate prices and indeed consumer prices? What's likely to be the consequences of the gallows for the union that Minister Putz is building at our ports? Well, of course, the ports issue is uh, um, an implementation issue rather than uh, an issue around uh, the end of the transition period. Um, for Northern Ireland as a whole, let's be absolutely clear that my party believes that having a free trade deal, zero uh, quota, zero tariff, um, is in the best interests of Northern Ireland. We also understand and, and, and uh, want people to understand that there are issues under the protocol that we think uh, could be sorted out. So we want to see unfettered access between us and our main market. Now, of course, um, and I understand the bill is being reintroduced today uh, in Parliament, um, there is a legislative route for that within the United Kingdom. But there are also routes for that within the Joint Committee. And sensible, practical, pragmatic approaches by the EU could ensure that these things happen. We want to understand um, that um, goods um, at risk um, will uh, be sorted out in the Joint Committee. And as the member quite rightly says, those goods coming in to uh, Northern Ireland for inputs into the agriculture sector, um, that they are treated as not being at risk of going into the single market. Mr Patsy McLone. Thanks very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And I too would just uh, join with all this in, in wishing all the very best to, to Edwin, to the Minister, uh, for a, a speedy and full recovery. 
um, a tricky enough situation he found himself in over the weekend. So, Minister, uh, I don't necessarily expect you to know the answer to this one because it's a bit complicated, but I've been contacted by a sheep farmer this morning who has bought hundreds of sheep and they're in the UK. Now, the sheep, before they can be brought over here, have to be a year old. Uh, that year will take them into the new year. So, um, with everything that's going on at the moment, he finds himself basically in New Year limbo land as to whether or not he may bring them over. And he has invested considerable hundreds of thousands of pounds in that stock. So, we spoke earlier about productivity. We need the product to be able to be productive. So, perhaps the Minister could get back to me with some clarity around that, please. Yes, um, thank you for your good wishes uh, to Edwin. I'll certainly pass on the good wishes of the House when I speak to him later, give him an update on how we got on. Um, and in fact, this is an issue that the Minister actually updated the Executive on um, in our EU Executive meeting on Thursday, and an issue that I know he has been working on over the uh, past number of days. And uh, there is, as yet, uh, there still needs to be a resolution, but I, of course, will ask the Minister to write to you specifically on the issue uh, and with any uh, ways of resolving this impasse. Mrs Rosemary Barton. Minister, also, if you could pass on my good wishes to Mr Poots and wish him a speedy recovery. Minister, would an oversight similar to the grocery code adjudicator that is in place throughout the United Kingdom, but tailored for Northern Ireland needs, be of assistance perhaps to improve farm gate prices if they, if in the future? Um, again, thank uh, the member for good wishes. Um, there has been much talk about minimum price legislation, um, and there has uh, about uh, Northern Ireland primary producers being price takers as opposed to price makers um, within uh, the whole um, supply chain system. Um, personally, I'm, I, I think that while the groceries adjudicator had the potential to do good things, I think the lack of any kind of enforcement powers meant that this was largely um, something um, that, that sounded good but didn't actually have the powers to respond to the needs of the supply chain. And therefore, if we were going to have more of this, we would need to have something that had much, much more uh, powers legislative to actually take remedial action. Ms. And I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Um, just following on from the question that was asked by my constituency colleague, Mr McGlone, I know I have written to um, your colleague, Mr Putz, about this issue as well, about the, the fact that sheep now being brought in from Scotland, the uh, majority of them would be black-faced sheep, that require scrupy monitoring. Um, and I just want to, to press upon the Minister the urgency, because as Mr McGlone has mentioned, this involves thousands of pounds for, for local sheep producers that are depending upon sheep that they, are, they have already bought from Scotland. Um, and again, um, I know that the Minister is alive to the situation. The Minister will respond to the situation. And I suppose on a general point, it demonstrates the issues around the protocol and why some in this House who call for the full implementation of the protocol create rods for the backs of some of our farmers. Mr William Humphrey. Principal Deputy Speaker, question number two. Thank you uh, for the question. Responsibility for dealing with illegal dumping is shared between local councils who deal with low-level waste offences and NIEA who deal with large-scale waste criminality and hazardous waste. While uh, there are no plans at present to strengthen the legislation around illegal dumping, officials are working with councils to consider the effectiveness of the existing legislation and explore how they can work together to make best use of the powers that they provide. This may create opportunities to deal more quickly and effectively with lower level offending on a local level through fixed penalty notices rather than being reliant on court proceedings, the timings of which are outside our control. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answers so far. Over the summer, some 200 tonnes of illegal rubbish was dumped in Eden Dairy Industrial Mill, my constituency in the Crumlin Road, North Belfast. This led to a plague of rats, a swarm of flies, noxious smells, people feeling and taking ill. As a response, Belfast City Council was too slow. The Northern Ireland Environment Agency was somewhat secretive in passing information, sharing information 
with elected representatives. The situation simply not good enough, and it took an intervention from the Minister to resolve it. Can I ask the Minister, in responding for her colleague, Mr Poots, to whom I too sent my regards to this morning for a speedy recovery, what more can the Department do, working with local councils, to ensure that if such a situation arises again, and sadly it is happening more often in Northern Ireland, that we can have a more effective and speedy response? Can I uh, thank the member again for his question? And I understand and followed the story um, and how it impacted on the lives of local people um, in uh, that part of the Shankill. Um, it is really quite disgraceful that these things um, continue to happen. Um, and I suppose the answer lies in this closer working relationship between district councils and NIEA. Um, so that while NIEA are responsible for the, the larger uh, waste criminality, that councils can take a proactive approach around uh, fly tipping um, and trying to bring the two together so that one is not passing the responsibility on to the other and we need a situation like we had in the Shankill where uh, there had to be... Um, an intervention from the minister uh, to, to, to actually do that. Um, the additional powers that we would be looking at and that the minister will be looking at would be uh, around councils giving them discretionary powers to take enforcement action uh, in respect of illegal waste disposal other than littering um, and with the provision of uh, more robust penalties for them. Um, as this works through the system. Dr. Steve Aiken. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Uh, Deputy Principal Speaker. And may I thank the Minister for her comments so far. Uh, first of all, could she pass on our good wishes to Edwin? And it's good to see that it will be getting some first hand knowledge of how well our NHS is coping at this present moment in time. But I would like to ask the Minister if there's any information to confirm that waste is coming from the Republic of Ireland and is now being dumped in Northern Ireland illegally. Uh, again, can I thank my colleague for his good wishes for Edwin, but to remind everyone that Edwin is a former health minister in this house and is acutely aware um, of uh, how uh, amazing uh, our National Health Service has been uh, in response to the pandemic. His wife also is a nurse who has had many years of service uh, in uh, the National Health Service. Um, I uh, do not specifically have information on that. If there is specific information in the department, I will, of course, ask the department to write to you uh, on this uh, very specific area. I am aware that there have been various news stories around this issue, um, and we need to make sure that criminality of this sort is dealt with and that appropriate penalties are levied and costs directed to where they should be. Mr. Cathal Boylan. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answer so far and extend good wishes to the Minister and speedy recovery. But could I ask the Minister, uh, in relation to the illegal dumping, cross, especially cross border, I know in my own constituency, in the Fuse Forest, had a, a nature spot called Caricature Viewpoint, there's been over 50 incidents of illegal dumping over the last 18 months. Um, would the Minister bring it back to the Minister Poots that we need a cross-border operation here to ensure because there's clear evidence in some of this illegal dumping that that's what's happening and I would like a cross-border approach. Coramina Morgan. Yes, um, I uh, fully accept and agree with you that, um, and I know the Minister will as well, talk to his counterpart to ensure that this kind of criminality um, does not take place and that we can levy appropriate fines, make sure costs are apportioned appropriately and sensibly in the matter. Uh, and of course, I am sure that the Department will write to you on any specific instances they have around uh, the beauty uh, area that you talk about. Ms. Paula Bradshaw. Well, Deputy Speaker, um, Minister, given that we did see an increase or appear to see an increase in illegal dumping during the COVID lockdown, I'm just wondering how the Department is working with NIEA and the councils to look at broader issues around waste management. Thank you. The Council um, and uh, NAIEA and the Department are looking at how effective the legislation currently is. They will bring uh, forward further uh, proposals uh, around that. 
Uh, as I said uh, to my uh, colleague uh, from uh, the Shankill, where there were very, very serious incidents around this, um, and that those additional powers would uh, be conferred on councils to perhaps uh, have a more immediate response uh, to the issue of littering um, and uh, uh, illegal dumping. Mr. Gordon, Don. Principal Deputy Speaker. The UK-Japan uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement was signed on the 22nd of October 2020 and is largely based on the existing agreement between the EU and Japan. Similarly, the agreement in principle with Canada announced on the 21st of November 2020 will roll over the provisions of the existing Comprehensive Economic uh, tr uh, Trade Agreement. Both these agreements have still to be fully ratified, but once this has been done, they will give certainty for agri-food businesses exporting goods and will ensure they can continue to benefit from existing trading arrangements. For example, CETA includes tariff-free trade on 98% of goods that can be exported to Canada, including beef, fish and seafood. The SEPA agreement with Japan also secured tariff-free access for more agri-food goods and protection for some of our iconic products. Commitments on tariffs for both the UK and Japan have largely been transitioned uh, from the EU deal without changes. This deal sees tariffs for UK exports to Japan fall on beef, uh, pork, salmon and a range of other agricultural uh, exports subject to staged tariff liberalisation which is in line with the EU agreement. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I too pass on my best wishes to the Agriculture Minister Edmund Poots. I got a message today from him saying that he's receiving great service, so he obviously appreciates the health service that he had a contribution to as Minister. Uh, I do thank the, the Minister for answers, and I welcome the great news and the opportunities there are for uh, the agri food sector in Northern Ireland. Can the Minister give us uh, assurance that incoming uh, products and imports into Northern Ireland will meet the continuous high quality standards that are required? Um, Northern Ireland um, will um, meet uh, the standards because Northern Ireland will continue to employ um, EU uh, single market rules. Uh, in relation to these issues. I suppose the wider issue that the member refers to is around the potential for wider UK uh, free trade deals. And what we would really like to see there is that the United Kingdom as a whole makes sure that it does not accept um, agricultural produce that is uh, produced to a lesser standard, either environmentally or uh, socially, uh, in terms of the employment uh, aspects of this, uh, than it would expect uh, of Northern Ireland or other uh, member states from the United Kingdom. It is really important uh, that we do not make Northern Ireland produce, indeed United Kingdom produce, uncompetitive by undercutting it with cheap imports. Dr. Kiva Archibald. Gurmagat, a previous Concordia, and I'd also like to extend um, my good wishes to, to Edwin to, to get well soon. Um, can I ask the, the Minister, um, you referred to it yourself that the, the UK Japan free trade agreement largely replicates that with the EU, um, but would the Minister accept that due to the fact that there were no new tariff rate quotas, um, agree that some exporters could actually be at a disadvantage under this agreement? Gurmagat. The, the Japan agreement largely replicates um, the agreement that the, um, the EU has um, with um, Japan as well. Um, commitments and tariffs have been largely transitioned without changes, and this will see tariffs for UK exports uh, to Japan fall on pork, beef, salmon, and other agricultural produce. Um, where for, milk, for butter, milk and milk powders, uh, where there were uh, UK exports in 2019, UK exporters will continue to access Japan's market via their WTO TRQ. 
Mr. Alan Chambers. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I'd certainly like to join in the good wishes to uh, Minister Poots and his uh, reassuring that the NHS was there for him in a timely manner when he needed it. Uh, Minister, following the 1st of January 2021, will Northern Ireland food products, food products for export be labelled UK or EU? These are matters that will be worked out in the Joint Committee. Mr John Stewart. John Blair. Sorry. <laughs> Principal Deputy Speaker. <laughs> On autopilot. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I first of all associate myself and, and my colleagues with the good wishes expressed to Minister Poots in wishing him a full and, and speedy recovery. Um, I think that the Minister has clarified that, that uh, what is being talked about is at very best a replication of existing uh, EU uh, arrangements in terms of Canada and Japan. Can I ask more specifically then from either an economic or agricultural perspective if the Minister can tell us if there is any data available to show that there, if there is any benefit at all in terms of uh, trade or economy to, to the new arrangements? Um, I am I'm presuming you mean um, in relation to the trade uh, deals with Japan and Canada. Canada is one of our largest partners. The um, EU-Canada, uh, the CETA agreement trade deal, means that 98% of all products that pass between, those two uh, between the countries and now the United Kingdom actually are tariff-free. So that is a huge boost um, to the economy uh, of Northern Ireland, to the wider economy of the United Kingdom. And the good news about the Canada deal is that um, they are committed not just to the rollover of the deal, as we currently signed in November, but the renegotiation of parts of that deal so that it is bespoke for the rest of the United Kingdom. So it is a really important trade deal for Northern Ireland. The Japan trade deal is also important. Japan is one of the largest importers of agricultural produce in the world. There is an enormous opportunity to take uh, our product uh, to that market. So that is an another extremely important trade deal uh, for the Northern Ireland economy. The crux of the matter for Northern Ireland will be making sure that we are a full part of those trade deals notwithstanding the implications of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Once again, I apologise to the member for getting his name wrong. There's only one John Blair. Um, Mr Colin McGrath. In number four, Mr Speaker. I thank the member uh, for his question. Um, gorse or wildfires in mountainous areas in Northern Ireland have a significant impact on the environment and are a risk to life and property. Semi-natural habitats, which are often affected by such fires, include heathlands and blanket bog. Many of these areas are important nature conservation sites. Indeed, between 2010 and 2019, 64 wildfires have been recorded in areas of special scientific interest. These habitats can be damaged by fires with impacts ranging from gradual change in species composition arising from surface burns to complete loss of vegetation and seed banks in severe deep burns. In surface burns, the shift in vegetation composition can be undesirable, such as increases in gorse or bracken, whilst in deep burn, the impacts can lead to long-term erosion due to lack of vegetation cover. The wildlife living within these areas are also negatively impacted, including the loss of foraging areas and the destruction of nests and eggs of important breeding hens, uh, birds such as the hen harriers. The damage caused to habitats and species can take many years to recover or they may be lost forever. Such fires also threaten life, property, forestry, agriculture, land, public water supplies and other public utilities and impact on emergency response services to the cost of millions of pounds to the public purse. Most of these wildfires are the result of human activities and are preventable. Proactive steps to recognise and address the risk of wildfires have and will continue to be taken by my department, other stakeholders and landowners. 
through public messaging, awareness raising, the establishment of wildfire groups such as in the Mourns and the Belfast Hills, and the development of wildfire management plans in areas uh, of special scientific interest. Officials have gained considerable expertise in regard of, to the issues of wildfires through liaison with local land lo owners and knowledge exchange with other European countries and will continue uh, to develop uh, ways forward. 2020, uh, uh, just can I add one important fact? 2020 was the worst year uh, for wildfire uh, fires since 2011, and up to May of this year, the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service had had to deal with over 600. Mr. McGrath. Mr. President, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the comprehensive response and add my weight to those remarks for Minister Putz to wish him well. Um, would the Minister agree that something has happened because the number of wildfires within mountainous areas across the north and across the island of Ireland is substantially increasing? Uh, events which were only supposed to happen one in 100 years, one in 50 years, are happening on an annual basis. It's costing millions of pounds. Would the Minister agree that maybe climate change is playing a part here and that we must respond? Respond accordingly. I think, as, as my answer made clear, I think that there are a range of factors involved in this, um, including um, pressures from climate change, but also human behaviour um, within when people are uh, walking in the mountains, uh, etc. Um, what we need to ensure that they, we are working together, that we are. Um, properly disseminating information about, one, the dangers, but two, also the dangers to our environment and the cost to the public purse uh, around these uh, issues. Mr. Declan McAleer. Um, can I get, uh, thank the Minister for answer. Uh, I also want to be associated with ex extending uh, my best wishes to the Minister. I sent him a message earlier on today, so I'm glad to note that he's He's going in the right direction. I want to commend Minister Dodds for coming in short as well. You're doing a, doing a good job so far. No? So, fair play to you. Um, uh, just, just on the topic of Gorse Fire, unfortunately, early on this year, at the beginning of the lockdown, whenever the weather was incredibly warm, we did witness a lot of uh, those Gorse Fires in my own district, where, where I'm from as well. Um, but I will say that it's important that, uh, that the department, indeed all the departments, educate and inform people as to the damage that these fires do to people's lives, to the biodiversity, and indeed, whenever the people here be impacted uh, by these fires, try to engage with the compensation agency, it becomes like a, a legal quagmire for them as well. So does the Minister agree it's important that everybody, everybody together does their best to educate and inform people about these fires and the impact that they, ha they have? Um, yes, can I thank the member? Um, we live, and we are very privileged to live, in one of the most beautiful parts of the world. Uh, and many of us, um, and uh, like the member from South Down, uh, my whole family is from the Mourns area, so I know exactly the beauty um, of uh, these particular uh, areas. So it is really disappointing when people who are there abuse um, their, their privilege uh, of walking and, and having um, uh, time in the hills. And what I would say is that we need to have that kind of multi-agency approach between the NIEA, the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service, the Forestry Service, the Rescue Services, um, to uh, try to have the strategy right so that people can be safe um, in these beautiful areas, but also have respect for them as well. And I agree with the member that this will require um, information campaigns so that people understand their responsibilities. Thank, <coughs> excuse me, thank you, members. And we now move to topical questions. Before I call the first member, members will know that I'm a, a relaxed and fairly easygoing sort of a person and wouldn't stand too much on formality or uh, anything like that. But if I could impress upon members short, sharp questions, please. And to have a perfect example of that, I call Mr. Daniel McCrossan. You may judge that in a minute. <laughs> uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I too would like to associate uh, myself with the comments and wishing uh, Minister Putz uh, well and a speedy recovery, and also to put firmly on record my sincerest appreciation to him for visiting Mean Bog uh, outside of Castle Derg following the slippage that caused huge difficulties. It was a very, very uh, good meeting, and I was glad to be there. Um, Minister, uh, I know you're uh, filling in today, but is it possible to give an update uh, on the Department's work? 
uh, regarding mean the mean bog landslide and specifically uh, where we are in terms of clean up, uh, in terms of the root cause, confirming the root cause, even though most of us know what it is, and what works have been undertaken to prevent it happening in future. Thank you. Well, I did um, read some of the newspaper reports of the visit to Mean Bog. Um, uh, it is just over the last 12 hours that I've become much more uh, tuned in to the issues involved uh, there. Um, so I'm happy uh, to tell the member that the LOCKS agency staff are continuing their investigation into the recent um, major water pollution incident um, there. Um, the incident uh, appears to be the result of significant slippage of an enormous quantity of peat and soil at the upper end of the catchment uh, around the waterway. Um, the nature and type of the remedial uh, measures uh, will be uh, dependent on the environmental assessments that are currently uh, underway, and those will include water quality data, fisheries evaluations, invertebrate assessments, and riverbed silt uh, evaluation. And it will be some time um, before that is done. But as this is an issue uh, that the Minister has taken and has met his counterpart uh, from the Republic of Ireland on, and that it is being worked on by the LOCKS agency and uh, is being taken taken forward as a matter of priority. Mr. McCrossan. I thank the Minister for the answer to the question uh, and absolutely acknowledge that the mean bog uh, slippage was a catastrophe and affected Kalita, Ahi Iron, Castle Derg and Ardstrawn area surrounding uh, quite, quite significantly. Uh, and the meeting between Minister Putz and Minister McConnell was very, very effective and uh, showed a great uh, sign of strength and, 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 and unity around this particular cross border issue. Uh, Minister, one particular business was impacted very, very badly as a result of the slippage. I'm not sure if you, you'll be aware, but maybe you'll update us now or on a further stage, if there's any form of uh, compensation that could help uh, the pressure that's been put on that business and, uh, by way of compensation. Well, while I am aware of the measures that uh, the LOCKS agency are undertaking um, around the remedial issues that need to be resolved because of this uh, particular issue, I am today unaware of the particular business, uh, but I will, of course, ask officials from the department uh, to contact you and talk uh, through the issue uh, that uh, is of interest to you. Ms. Rachel Woods. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I too wish Minister Poots all the best as he recovers and for the Minister for standing in today, and I will be very short in my questions. I would like to ask the Minister how, to outline how rural perspectives were considered when drafting the clean air strategy. Um, I, I as with all uh, of these particular strategies, there is a very wide-ranging uh, number of perspectives uh, that are taken into account. But if the member has a particular concern that a very particular issue was not addressed, then I would advise her to write to the minister so that it can be properly considered. Ms. Woods. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Um, I would like, like to ask why a population of 10,000 was chosen as a threshold beyond which air quality assessment would be conducted, even though this would exclude most rural areas from assessment and risk ag agriculture pollution not being fully measured. I'm presuming the modelling um, indicated that this was a, a particular uh, number that was acceptable. Um, in this particular incident, uh, but of course um, I would advise the member to contact the minister, to write to the minister and advise him of her concerns. Mr Doug Beattie. And it's good to see uh, the economy minister supporting her, her ministerial colleague. I look forward to the day when uh, ministers from right across the floor will support each other. Um, minister, following the su successful river works on the, the Blackwater in catchment, um, has the, uh, the Minister any plans to expand those works further along the river ban? I would, of course, be very supportive of this from a um, constituency point of view. Um, I consider the River Ban and our particular part of it to be one of the most beautiful parts of Northern Ireland. Um, and I am, of course, and uh, it is a personal view, uh, since I um, walk the river quite a lot um, during uh, the, the, the week with the dogs, um, I, I, I would consider that this is important. Um, can I say on a general basis, and I, I will uh, report this to the Minister, but can I say on a general basis, 
um, that um, there has been really good work done in some of the remedial tidying up and the dredging of, of, of so much um, unnecessary dumping uh, of rubbish in, in the river and so on. Um, and I think as a general point of view that we would want to see cooperation to make sure that these issues uh, don't happen and that people act responsibly to ensure that the beautiful environment we have is maintained. Mr. Peter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and Minister, I kept my questions local because um, I knew you were standing in. But just to add to that, uh, as you know, local constituent um, John Medlow uh, has been working hard with volunteers to clean the river ban himself. Um, I believe you might have met him. Does the Minister have any plans to give financial aid to allow volunteers like John and other groups to carry on this really important work? I do agree with you that it is important work. Um, and I think that um, caring for, sustaining, um, and future-proofing uh, the assets we have are hugely, hugely important. Um, and I speak not just as a local, um, but also as the tourism minister, because we need uh, to ensure that we have the best. This, this is what brings people to Northern Ireland. Um, so um, I, 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 I want to commend the groups for their work and, and what they do. Uh, and of course, uh, I will pass on your concerns to the minister around funding for such groups. Mr. Gordon Dom. Deputy Speaker, as we all strive for a cleaner and greener environment, can the minister clarify who has responsibility for the cleaning of litter and detritus from our public footpaths and roadsides? Well, as um, the member said, we all have our part to play in this. Um, and I know that the minister is committed um, to um, education um, and building civic pride around our beautiful environment. Um, and uh, that the department does work closely with councils and other NGOs uh, to support um, education promotional campaigns that achieve uh, behavioural change uh, in uh, reduction of litter. DERA's Environment Fund supports Keeping Northern Ireland Beautiful, which runs a series of successful programmes, including Eco Schools, Live Here, Love Here, Clean Coast, Adopt a Spot, and over three million has been awarded to Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful since 2007, with an additional current funding of over one million to support educational and promotional campaigns. Um, the Clean Neighbourhoods and Environment Act enables councils to issue fines of eight, up to £80 for litter offences uh, or uh, £2,500 fines for cases that have to be dealt with through the court. These are very, very important issues and impact on everybody's everyday life, and I thank the member for raising it. Mr. Tom. Mr. For answer, can the minister, though, um, under the Litter Order Act of 1994 in Northern Ireland, can she uh, give us an assurance that NAEA will use their influence on local councils to ensure that public footpaths and roadways are clean and safe for all road users? Because there does seem to be a reluctance by some councils to clean public footpaths on roads where there is extensive traffic use. I am sure the Minister will agree with the member that it is extremely important that we use every power available as to us to make sure that we have um, done our best to make sure that uh, roads, uh, footpaths, etc. are clean um, and fit for purpose um, and suitable for the beautiful uh, environment that we have in Northern Ireland. Mr. Trevor Lunn. Deputy Speaker and Minister, could you pass on my good wishes to Edwin Poots, my constituency colleague as well. Um, I want to ask about anaerobic digestion plants. Sorry to spring this on you, but the, uh, the Minister Poots has let it be known more than once, and actually recently, that he doesn't think that Northern Ireland needs an incinerator. So could I ask the Minister on his behalf to outline what she feels that the impact would be on the provision of anaerobic digestion plants? Well, we currently um, 
have the, the debate around uh, the incinerator. I have no intention of uh, engaging in that today. Um, however, uh, my department is responsible for a new energy strategy. Um, and looking at different types of energy and how that can be uh, inputted into the grid will be absolutely key to that. We hope to bring out that, consult that strategy for consultation in March of next year, um, and uh, the member will, I am sure, contribute uh, his views on anaerobic digestion um, and waste and energy within that. Mr. Lund. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. The Minister would know that the, the, the jury is out on anaerobic digestion as a long-term solution to our needs, particularly in view of the, the carbon footprint of the whole process, the um, ex extent to which they depend on government subsidy at the moment, and the limited life of the plant involved, which I believe is no more than about 10 years, at huge cost to replace it. So are we quite sure that the, the Edwin, sorry, Minister Poots should not exclude totally the requirement for an incinerator, because an awful lot of academic information out there seems to indicate that we do need one, and fairly quickly. I am sure the member will make his views on this issue uh, known uh, to Minister Putz in relation to uh, the issue of waste, and as I've said, in relation to the issue of energy and the contribution to energy. Um, the strategy will be out for consultation in March of this year, and I look forward to uh, receiving various views uh, on all of these issues. Thank you. Mr. Marvin Storey. Principal Speaker, and can I, with others, pass on? My best wishes to my colleague, uh, the Minister for Agriculture. And can I also uh, just add to the Minister's comments about the River Band? You'll also know that it does run through my constituency as well, and Drummond Hagels, uh, uh, adjacent to the River Band, is also a beautiful part of Northern Ireland, and I have no doubt you've enjoyed some happy times there as well. Could the Minister provide an update on the initiative to tackle rural poverty and social isolation? Because this has become an issue, Minister, that you'll be well aware of in your other ministerial responsibility, particularly over the last number of months in relation to the impact of COVID. Yes. Um, can I thank the member for his uh, question around uh, rural uh, poverty and social isolation? And indeed, particularly the issue of isolation and loneliness has been exacerbated um, by the COVID restrictions. Um, and there are some very touching stories of how that has impacted um, folk, particularly older folk living uh, within uh, isolated rural areas. The um, TRIPSI programme continues to provide support to a range of initiatives in collaboration with other government departments, statutory agent agencies, and the community and voluntary sector. Um, this has uh, helped on average 60,000 rural dwellers to address poverty, isolation and health and well-being issues. An additional uh, 5 million has been confirmed to help rural dwellers, communities and assist businesses to recover from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. This brings the TRIPSI programme budget for 2020-21 to almost £11 million. This uh, increase in financial support has uh, enabled the department to uh, approve a number of schemes to bolster the rural economy, to sustain and increase capacity within the rural economy. 30 seconds. Uh, Mr. Storey. Mr. Principal Speaker, uh, could the Minister maybe update us and clarify if there has been collaboration with the Department for Communities in relation to this initiative? Yes, um, the department works closely with the Department for Communities and with local councils as delivery agents in relation to this initiative, and it is indeed very valuable uh, for rural dwellers in Northern Ireland. Thank you, members. That concludes questions to the Minister for Agriculture. If members take their ease for a few moments, we will then move on to questions to the Minister for Communities. And if you're leaving the chamber, don't forget to clean the surface where you were sitting. Thank you.
Order, members. We now move on to questions for the Minister for Communities, and I call Mrs. Dolores Kelly to ask the first question. Thank Mrs. you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question one, Minister. Uh, thank you, Priyu. Last can call you. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. And with your permission, I'm going to group questions one and ten. I will publish a consultation outcome report on the fundamental review of social housing allocations next week. This includes a primary or preliminary uh, time frame for implementation of the proposals. I have publicly stated that I will not proceed with the removal of intimidation points. Um, I want to retain these points for those who really need them. I know there is a strong perception that intimidation points were abused. I want to see alternative mechanisms implemented to strengthen and strengthen the verification process and indeed to put an end to this abuse. This may require the establishment of an independent body once options have been developed. I personally think it is unacceptable that victims of domestic violence are not treated with the same priority as those who currently receive intimidation points, and I want this to change as soon as possible. Mrs. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, in, in my constituency, many people have points of 130 plus, such as the housing shortage and crisis amongst many families. You'll be well aware of that, I'm sure, in your own constituency, none of which have intimidation points. But can I welcome in your answer uh, the particular regard that you want to pay to victims of domestic violence? And how do you think uh, that you might put um, a process or framework around that will ensure that domestic violence victims are not uh, um, disadvantaged in any way by any review? Thank the member for her question. Indeed, her supplementary, and as she rightly knows, in my constituency, some people are sitting on 240 points without intimidation, with no prospect of going anywhere. Um, but in relation to um, victims of domestic violence, I think there was a broad assumption that people who, you know, were sub subject to such abuse and violence were uh, getting alloc an allocation of uh, intimidation points, and this wasn't the case. It did come up in the consultation. It didn't come up as strongly as I felt it would, but it certainly came up since once people realised that that wasn't the case. So as soon as I publish the consultation report next week, I'll be moving straight into options with officials and hopefully have something in the coming months. But it is really important that this has changed. Ms. Linda Dillon. My question has actually been answered in what the Minister has just outlined because I, I was well aware that domestic abuse points unfortunately were not included in intimidation points. And I think you've just given the time frame, but just to clarify when we might expect the, the, these points to be in place because it has been a, an outstanding issue, certainly in my constituency, for a long time. Thank the member for her uh, question. Um, as a member will be aware, as part of the um, recent statement I made here regarding the overall tr housing transformation, and the case of the fundamental review was um, certainly highlighted. Um, that whole statement will have uh, uh, certainly needs to be changed within the changes in the statement need to be made within this mandate. But there are pieces of work within that, that I am currently progressing along with others. So I would hope within coming months that we'll have a completely different system in terms of the allocation of points, which will include intimidation points for those who have been victims of domestic abuse and violence. Mr Stuart Dixon. Speaker, thank you, Minister. Uh, indeed, thank you very much for, for indicating your strong priority for, for victims of domestic violence uh, in the future. But would you agree with me that there were disgraceful scenes in this House earlier today when the Chair of the uh, Justice Committee attempted to derail important uh, domestic violence legislation, and that will, uh, in fact, exacerbate the situation that you find yourself in? Um, well, taking the member's last point first, I did not see it. So I'll, I'll look at it, um, but certainly um, I think the start of his uh, question was really in relation to why people have waited so long. Um, and I think just going from his and other people's um, responses and reactions, we'll agree that this is quite appropriate, that these intimidation points are kept for people who have been subject to domestic abuse and violence. Ms. Michelle McElveen. Thank the member for her question. Um, my department's COVID-19 recovery revitalisation programme 
has already allocated £17.6 million to councils to enable them to create a safer environment for shoppers, visitors and workers, and this has included contributions of £5 million and £2 million from the Department for Infrastructure and the Department for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, respectively. The programme was designed to be as flexible as possible to ensure that each council would deliver a plan which addressed the specific needs in the area. And indeed, every council plan has included a small grant scheme to help businesses to provide more COVID-secure environment for their customers. The eligibility criteria and value of these grants was determined by each council in consultation with local stakeholders. The total value of these grants across councils, all councils, is currently approximately £6.9 million. Ms McElveen. Thank you, um, for the response to that question. Um, the previous tranche of funds, which was distributed to Arts and North Downborough Council, which covers the majority of, of my constituency, was available only to those businesses within the designated town centre, and that was at the suggestion of her department, leaving many dozens of businesses without the benefit of assistance. In fact, there were 22 in one street in Cumber alone. Um, is the minister going to do anything to provide assistance to those businesses who, by virtue of a line in a ma on a map, were unable to avail of that funding? Well, first of all, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, I mean, the member will be aware, even from her previous role, um, that I'm responsible for uh, townlands and villages with a population of 5,000 over. Um, both myself and Edmund Poots, who I also want to wish um, the very best, um, done this, uh, this scheme jointly to ensure that no one was left out. So I'd find out what happened, and I'd certainly write to the member, and hopefully. Um, Whatever did happen, in terms of whatever gaps there are, they're certainly closed, but I'll certainly get the detail and, and I'll actually talk to the member personally. Mr. Pat Catney. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Minister, I was wondering if uh, you could uh, provide a breakdown of the number of businesses uh, that have this money has already reached and uh, examples of and by council area, if possible. Well, I don't have that detailed hand, um, but certainly I'll write to the member. But certainly, I know some of the when I was talking to some of the businesses about how they were hoping to avail of this. So we're looking at additional sanitation. We're looking at infrastructure around safe social distancing. Some of them were looking at outside heaters, street furniture, awnings, um, gazebos, um, and things like that in order to try and help bring customers in in a, in a safe way. But I again uh, have. Don't have the details to hand at the award each council got, but I'll certainly get it from the member. Commissioner Ennis. Yet, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, Minister, we know that there's been a delay with some of uh, the financial support schemes established recently. Uh, can the minister set out the steps that she has taken to ensure councils receive these allocations quickly? Well, I thank the member for her question. Um, I mean, that's why I'm a bit, a bit surprised to hear. The, um, cons the concerns that Michelle McElveen has raised, because the onus on both myself, Evan Pouts, and indeed Nicola Mullen was to ensure that these schemes, unlike others, got out as quickly as possible through our councils, um, who indeed have been funded by this department to ensure that they are given frontline services as quickly as possible. Um, so, unlike other schemes, the councils, to be fair to them, have acted very, very quickly. We have made the application as simple and as straightforward as possible while respecting and honouring due diligence and ensuring that each council, council was as flexible to the needs of their local businesses as possible. Um, so, again, um, as each tranche has rolled out, we have ensured that speed has been off the essence, and I hope and look forward to ensuring that that is the case right across the board. Ms Karen Mullen. Uh, Thank the member for her question. So my department has a number of supports in place, which include the automatic one-off COVID-19 heating payment of £200, um, and for people who have received a pension credit or the highest rates of disability benefits, £10 Christmas bonus to people in receipt of a qualifying benefit, a winter fuel payment of £100 to £300 for older people, a cold weather payment of £25, universal credit allowance has also increased. I have increased the annual income threshold for discretionary support 
have instructed the self-isolation grant for people diagnosed with COVID. The provision of food remains a priority for me, and I provided an additional almost £800,000 to Fair Share, a food redistribution charity, and indeed £750,000 to councils to have access to food. My department has also allocated for £3.5 million um, for access to food, and I hope to make announcements in the not-too-distant future about our warm, well and connected policies throughout December and indeed January. Ms Mullen. I thank the Minister for her answer so far and for her work on ongoing support to those most vulnerable and also for meeting with the community and voluntary sector along with myself um, and Darian Straban last week. Can I ask the Minister to outline her intention to work collectively with all our departments and agencies to ensure long-term and targeted support is provided to those most in need? Um, I thank the member for a question. And indeed, it was a pleasure to meet uh, both herself and Martina Anderson, and indeed the many workers from the Foyle constituency from right across the community. Um, I think it is important just to put it on record, even just in response to the last question. Both myself, Edmund Poots, and Nicola Mullen are working on the revitalisation fund for councils. Both myself, Naomi Long, and Robin Swan are working around supporting people, and indeed, particularly around homelessness. And indeed. From an executive's point of view, you know, every allocation that I have received, I have enjoyed the full support of each executive minister in relation to the substantial money going into sports and arts. But it is important that we do uh, use public money to give better outcomes for people. So just to reassure the member and indeed other members that I will continue to take that approach. Mr. Mark Durkin. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Uh, can the Minister confirm if a household can receive multiple heating payments if there are more than one eligible individuals living at that address? Um, well, it's just one household. So the COVID heating payment is a one-off. That's on top of the winter fuel payment, um, which is anything from £100 to £300, pounds, and it's a household who's the applicant. So. Um, this is in addition to what was already there, um, and particularly, as I'm sure the member will agree, um, given the fact that people have had to isolate a lot longer than what we thought we would in March, and we're going into a really, really cold spell, it's really important that people not only stay warm, but to stay safe and to stay well. Mr Roy Beggs. Can the Minister advise where individuals who are in receipt of a supplementary payment due to their complete loss of their award when transitioning from DLA to PIP are entitled to this additional heating payment? Well, the, the criteria is for anybody who is on pension credits or higher rates of disability, higher rates of PIP, including the childcare or the children as well. So if they are currently in receipt of that, never mind what they are transferring to, they will meet the criteria and should receive it. If the member has examples where he feels that may not be the case. He can just drop it up to my office. Ms. Paula Bradshaw. Um, Minister, you'll recall um, this time last year, approximately myself, yourself, and Christopher met with the. Uh, sorry, question number four. It's too close to Christmas, Paula. Anyway, yes, I do recall that a draft framework and policy proposals for the legislation on sign language was consulted on prior to the publication of the new decade new approach, which committed us all to introducing a sign language bill. It is my hope to introduce a sign language bill very soon in this mandate, and my officials are engaging with the Office of Legislative Council with a view to establishing a timetable and preparing instructions. Ms. Thank you. Apologies for that. Um, as you re re recall from that evening we spent in the, the um, church hall in my constituency, um, how important the sign language bill and language will be. And I'm sure you will have heard from many constituents about the loneliness they have felt during this um, lockdown. I'm just wondering, to what degree will you be reading across, not just in terms of access to public services, but access to wider societal um, issues like sport and community life? Well, the member will, will be aware that even um, in certainly the, the, the last year when I was in DECAL, I brought forward the framework, and that framework was widely consulted upon, um, and it did touch across different sectors, um, and it was with the help um, of the sign language framework that we will inform 
the bill come forward? There has, this has been widely consulted upon. If anything we have heard from the sector is just to get on with it. Minister, thanks for your answers thus far. Um, can you advise if lessons will be learnt from um, what was done in the south of Ireland and in Scotland as well? And can you uh, commit to meeting with uh, the, the sector in terms of implementation of, of this? Um, well, uh, well, thank you. And I know that um, all other jurisdictions and legislators have been consulted upon and any bills or acts or pieces of work that they brought forward not only helped shape the framework but will help shape the bill. And I met, um, I met with uh, people who are, who are deaf or partially deaf not so long ago and I have made a point of um, meeting as many people from that sector, including parents who have children who have lost their hearing or don't have hearing. Um, so I am more than happy to, to meet more people, particularly given the fact that I mean, this is not put on a statutory footing and there is a denial of rights here, particularly for families, uh, because this is, this is how they communicate through sign language and we definitely need the legislation to enable that. Mr George Robinson. Mr Principal, Principal Deputy, uh, question five, please. Thank the member for his question when I can find it. So for a payment to be made in a public liability claim, there must be some degree of neg negligence established. So therefore, depending on the circumstances and given rise to a water leak, and in some cases it may attach to the housing executive, or in other cases it has been attached to the contractor, it's also possible that there could be an establishment of joint responsibility against both the housing executive and the contractor. Tenants are advised um, to have uh, contents insurance in place, but this isn't always affordable. The housing executive provides a useful guidance and information on public liability claims on its website, um, and I would welcome any comment from anyone if you take the opportunity to have a look at that. Thank you. Mr. Robinson, thank the minister <clears throat> for her answer. But will she undertake to ensure that clear, clear guidance? is issued to tenants, as at present there is confusion and frustration at no clear pathway for Northern Ireland executive tenants? Well, I would certainly have another look at it, um, and if it needs clear, well, you're telling me it needs cleared up, so we would need to have a look at it, um, and then I would certainly write to the Chief Executive and the Chair of the Board thereafter. Any guidance on any department's website needs to be, you know, as clear and as plain as possible so people can get access to information and hopefully the services that they need. So I will certainly do that. Mr Mike Nesbitt. Thank you very much. I thank, thank the Minister. I, I wonder if she could inform the House, either today or in writing, of the average amount paid out in recent years um, because of damage, uh, which is the responsibility of contractors. Well, I um, will have to do that in writing. Um, because I don't have, I don't have that um, information. Um, I also know that, for example, when there has been, uh, you know, a, certainly a contest of who, who has the responsibility, it has become protracted, and unfortunately, the tenants are always sitting in the middle. And I don't think anybody thinks that's a satisfactory position to be in. But I'd certainly get that information and write to the member. I call Ms. Liz Kimmins. Very well, good briefless. Can I call in and I thank the minister for her answer so far. Can the Minister um, advise, are public liability claims against the Housing Executive a uh, frequent occurrence? Well, I know um, certainly for anyone who is subject to water damages and leaks, particularly if a contractor has been in uh, once is enough. But again, like to the, the member for Strangford, Mr Mike Nesbitt, I get the, the member um, a breakdown of what has happened even in the years. 19 to 20, um, and indeed, I'll share it with Mr. Robinson, who asked the primary question about, first of all, where the housing executive was responsible, where the contractor was responsible, and what the outcome was, if any. Mr. Patsy McLean. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Principal Deputy Chief of Greggs. Well, we have slash and out of Foster. Um, could I ask the minister just the, the importance of updating tenants of their responsibilities in regard to proper recovery for contents in the lakes because we're coming into real cold weather. We've had a wee sample of it and you don't want people being left literally wet 
and caught with no cover at all, and their house possibly ruined through flood or other or other circumstances that have occurred through the poor weather in their home. The member probably heard at the start of my um, answer to Mr. Robinson. I mean, it is about affordability for many families who are on low income and are living in poverty. A decision to either pay for house insurance or feed their kids is often what they're dealing with. It is um, the responsibility that it's in the tenant handbook. It's constantly remained to two tenants by the Housing Association and indeed the Housing Executive. But equally, you know, when you're talking about families who are living in poverty, housing insurance isn't really on the top of their list. Ms. Joanne Bunting. Thank you. Question six, please. I thank the member for her question. Um, my department has a range of initiatives to support people facing financial hardship over the Christmas period. So as I, I give to um, Karen Mullen, just a breakdown. So you're talking about the winter fuel payment. You're also talking about the cold weather payment if um, there's prolonged cold spells. You're also talking about a Christmas bonus of £10. You're talking about an increase in discretionary support. Um, you're also talking about access to food and other supports um, that my department has funded the Council. And indeed, hopefully, very, very soon we'll be announcing additional supports as well. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful to the Minister for answering a note or earlier answer to you. I'm thinking of partic particularly of food banks at this stage and those who use them, because in East Belfast we have Mana and the Larder, um, both run by churches, both doing sterling work, um, but regrettably providing a vital service. But the Minister will know that as more people struggle, there's more in need, more people uh, desperate and fewer people able to give and the food banks are running short. Is there anything her department can do directly with food banks, or can she advise how food banks can tie in with Fair Share? Well, certainly both. I mean, Fair Share have received money from my department, um, and most of the community food banks, if not them all, are working very closely with Fair Share. And even in our own constituency, I know through some of the allocations from Belfast City Council, and even from my department through there have been monies going through. I'm currently looking at additional supports. I just want to put it in record. That, I mean, like ideally, there shouldn't be food banks. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. Um, there shouldn't be food banks. We need to have more money in people's pockets so they can make their own choices. But while while we are in this situation, um, I'm sure the member will agree that right across the executive through my department, there has been substantial support for bids for me to help people with food support um, and, indeed, uh, other essential items. Well, Ms. Cara Hunter. Hey, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Uh, can I ask the Minister if so someone should need to claim universal credit in the month of December, will her department be taking any steps in order to ensure people receive a universal credit payment, which can usually take up to six weeks, so that nobody will be left penniless at Christmas? Thank you. Absolutely, and the contingency fund is there. I mean, people shouldn't be waiting five weeks for their UC payment. They shouldn't be offered loans either. So the contingency fund is there, and there's also the discretionary support as well. So people can get a payment, which is, you know, no one should be sitting like that over Christmas. Um, and I just want to remind people why it is in legislation around universal credit, credit that you have to, you, you will wait a few weeks. People shouldn't be offered a loan first. They should be offered money from the contingency fund, and if that doesn't suit money from the discretionary fund. Mr. Robbie Butler. Mr. Deputy Speaker, thank the Minister for answering. On the back of Ms. Hunter's question, um, a vital uh, support mechanism, as you've picked out, is the discretionary support. However, I'm aware that applications are taking upwards of seven days at present in some incidents. Uh, can the Minister advise what steps she will take to reduce the time taken to process uh, applications this side of Christmas? I'm sorry to hear that, um, genuinely, because I was keeping, I am, but certainly was keeping a close eye to the um, average payment, and it worked out about four days, and still felt, you know, we could try and get a payment out as quickly as we can. Uh, but just to give the member assurance, the staff there have been increased, the training has been increased, um, the staff are completely committed and dedicated to ensuring that no one is left either without food or without money, particularly in these very, very cold days and in the run-up to Christmas. Ms Emma Rogan. 
Um, I would like to thank the Minister um, so far. Minister, what is your department doing to ensure that people are aware of the benefits that they are entitled to and to take up that help that is available to them? Certainly, I know advice and I will give them a plug, but certainly advice and I have been very good at publicising um, benefit take up campaigns, but certainly publicising what is available. I also know that anyone involved in the independent advice sector will be letting people know, as have um, the AGNI and many, NICFA and many, many others. The difficulty is you'll always find people who don't have access to social media, and if they're not connected to those groups, we do publish information. Um, and in, indeed, if there are instances where there's groups uh, or individuals, you know, who found out about something after the fact if the member or anybody else has that information come back to me because we want to close these gaps. We don't want anybody left sitting destitute or without. Dr. Kiva Archibald. Question seven please. So I thank the member for a question and I'm pleased to advise that we will be providing increased funding to help remove barriers to work for people receiving income related benefits. So, for example, in Scotland, the Job Start Scheme payment is a grant of 250 or 400 if the recipient is the main carer for a child or children. This is only available to those aged 16 to 24. Um, here, the, ad the Advisor Discretionary Fund can currently provide up to £300 to remove a barrier to work, and I'm increasing that limit to £1,500 in a 12-month period and expanding the range of supports that it can be used for. Dr. Archibald. Um, I thank the Minister for her response and um, that, that's useful information. Can the Minister um, provide any assurances in relation to the participation in job start programmes? I, I'm not sure. Is a member asking about sanctions? Because this isn't about sanctions. This is about a voluntary programme where you know people, you know, young people aged uh, 18 to 24 will hopefully you know, avail of. Um, and if they can't, rather than don't want to avail of it, they won't be sanctioned, which was the problem, particularly for young people um, with uh, educational challenges and certainly those with mental health issues and leaving care or being looked after. They were in the bracket of young people who were more sanctioned than others. So it was about can't making their appointment rather than just didn't bother turning up. Mr Robin Newton. Deputy Speaker, question number eight, Minister. Sorry about this. You're flying through these. Sorry about this. Sorry. So our local charity sector is vital to us as a community, especially now. I know that charities have been struggling financially because fundraising is down. In June this year, I put £15.5 million into the charity fund, and I'm pleased to say 501 successful applicants received a total of just under £9 million, 8 .8. I'm aware, acutely aware that charities are still facing significant, significant financial challenges, and I'm working, shortly, I'm working on uh, announcements shortly for a further phase of funding to support them. Mr. Newton. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister will know that um, although the numbers she quoted there have been supported, that quite a number have not been supported. And it seems to be that there are those charities who are, because they operate uh, in a national basis, um, even though they are independent in Northern Ireland, but because the reserves of the national body then the local body is perceived to be ruled out of getting funding from the Department for Communities. Can I ask the Minister if she would look at the situation where local bodies tied into national bodies are eligible for funding within the support that she has on offer? Um, I'm quite sorry to hear that. Uh, because any charity that has reserves does not exclude them from plan to this fund. And again, if the member has any examples, I'd be happy to receive those. Um, I mean, this is about how people try to raise money here for the charitable pur purposes here to provide good outcomes for people. Uh, the whole charity uh, fundraising has been greatly 
inhibited almost to the point where it has ceased. So I'd be really disappointed, particularly given the work that people are doing on our behalf, if they didn't get any support at all. Thank you. We now move on to topical questions. And the first member on my list is Mr David Hilditch. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, can I uh, seek some clarity around grassroots sport? I know there's been uh, a lot of talk and communications in relation to the elite sports, and they have got back on the road again, albeit with barriers in place. What is the situation, and can you clarify for grassroots, particularly of the younger side of things? Well, thank the member for his question, and I know his interest, um, certainly in grassroots sports. I'm hopefully getting a bit more detail on that today or early tomorrow. I mean, the, the number of spectators has increased from where it was, but I, I think the member's asking when can the training in that commence, um, and we're, I'm still waiting on those regulations to be sorted out. I would hope they'll be sorted out as soon as possible, um, because... I know that a lot of sporting bodies, but particularly the smaller clubs, have been excellent in terms of social distancing and providing sanitation um, mm -hmm. for some of the youngsters and to try to keep them as safe as possible. Mr. Hildich. Thank you. And I appreciate the, the Minister's answer. And I'm sure she will appreciate that kids are now developing from around five, six years of age through the early teens before they go into those sort of older age groups. It's that sort of very young element. And they've lost out so much this year. I'm just seeking the Minister's support that that will be looked into as quick as possible and clarity so what? Well, I'll, what I'll do is, um, I mean, the chair of the Communities Committee is here and when those regulations are brought forward and further clarification and guidance is offered, it will be copied to the committee, but I'm sure it's copied to yourself as well. Mr Roy Beggs. Retailing forms an important element of our town centres but all, whether multinational or local independents, are struggling with the online shift. Um, but they still form an important social and community space. So my question to the Minister, uh, what action have you taken in terms of contacting the Finance Minister to get a reduction in the long-term level of rates that are charged, so that more realistic rents are charged and that more businesses will be able to survive and provide a service to the community? Well, I haven't had a conversation with the, the finance minister about long-term trajectory of rates. Uh, we were more focused on, first of all, there has been rates uh, reliefs. There certainly has been his support and indeed all the executive colleagues' support, including your own colleague, for the revitalisation fund, getting money out to help particularly small and local businesses. Um, but I'm happy to uh, copy the answer to Conor Murphy of your question. Mr Beggs. I thank the, the, the Minister for her response, but, but there is considerable pressure which will be ongoing beyond our COVID period, and that's why I'm, I'm asking the question. And similarly, um, has the Minister, or in conjunction with the Finance Minister, made contact with the Chancellor so that our online large retailers such as Amazon pay fair taxation and are in, unable to continue to shift their profits offshore uh, and use complex tax avoidance methods? leaving local retailers at a disadvantage? Well, I, I, wouldn't norm, I wouldn't ever contact the British Chancellor because it normally happens protocol as it goes through the Finance Minister. I have absolutely no doubt that in relation to supporting our local businesses, uh, that has been raised. I mean, the issue of big global companies coming here and paying very little tax has been one been with us a long time. And I agree with the member. I don't think they pay their fair share. In fact, there's been court battles, which are probably still ongoing around some of those big names. Uh, they're not paying their fair share either. Their employees are, but as companies, they aren't, and that's not right. Mr. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I know the Minister has been uh, very vocal and very supportive of all levels of sporting groups, and I know the Minister will also share my fear that some of the, the groups, whether they're grassroots, amateur or elite, are coming under viability pressures at this time. Could the Minister give us an update on the Sports Hardship Fund and any other work that her um, department has undertaken? Well, I thank the member for his question, and indeed I share his concern around the impact indeed that David Hildage has raised. Um, I think that this year has been horrendous for many people and you know, particularly young people have lost out in quite a lot in terms of socialisation and their friends and no, no better example of that when they're with their, their friends, um, when they're playing sport. 
In terms of sports hardship, um, I'm sure the member will be aware that I have paid significant money forward and indeed there's £25 million going into sport. I met with the governing bodies in the Northern Ireland Sports Forum last week, uh, along with Sport NI. We want this process to be as straightforward as possible. The applications are open. Hopefully, awards will be made at the end of January, beginning of February, to help people not just about their loss, but the impact of COVID. But the best thing that we can do is get these, this guidance sorted out as quickly as possible so people can get back to doing what they want. Mr. Butler. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Give you a proper title this time, and thank the Minister for her answer. Um, I've had a, a number of uh, emails and le uh, written letters from constituents concerned about the viability of Belfast Giants at the SSA Arena, uh, a, a great success for, for Northern Ireland and one of the sports that truly unites us here. Um, can the Minister outline if she has uh, had any contact with Belfast Giants or if she is aware of any uh, assistance that has been sought, and would she then, if that was the case, consider any application that was made? Um, well, certainly, you know, like many others, I was, or maybe not like you, but I was shocked to find that the Belfast Giants are here 20 years. It's just let you in, in, in the blink of an eye. I won't personally receive any applications, so it will be Sport and I. I'm aware that they've made an application or will make an application because I've seen them covered in the news, a local news bulletin, not mention their name in case you're giving them an unfair advantage. Um, but again, that's, that's been something that many of the groups are talking about because they obviously they need some support. But certainly, um, the, the Belfast Giants are more than aware of the application process. Ms Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, I just want to follow on from uh, my, the previous uh, speaker and welcome the Sports S Sustainability Fund, which opened on Friday. just want to ask the rationale behind um, all of those groups and organisations and clubs having to go through their governing bodies. I can see how that might benefit those larger organisations, such as football, GA and rugby. But for some of those smaller um, groups and uh, clubs, their affiliated bodies may be in other parts of the UK or Republic of Ireland and slightly more difficult. So just the rationale behind that. Well, just to give the member assurance that the governing bodies aren't making decisions on their applications, they're supporting them. Um, and the Sports Forum uh, deals with a lot of the other governing bodies, the smaller ones, and indeed Sport and I usually deal with some of the elite athletes and others. Um, it's also to help them with the template, particularly the smaller groups. So like, for example, a small five-a-side football team should not have to go through the same due diligence as Linfield. That's not fair, but the IFI should be there helping them, and indeed anybody else. So that, that was the rationale behind that. Ms Bradley. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Can I then, on the same vein, ask as well um, what conversation she's had with the Finance, finance Minister? I was recently made um, aware of a cricket club that had applied to the Finance Minister through the Finance Minister for that stream of funding, but was told that they had to apply through this sports fund. So it's just asking you, um, will there be an even playing field, whether it's a working man's club, a social club or a sports club, that they'll not be disproportionately affected applying through the sports instead of the, the Department of Finance funding? Well, the, the primary function is about sport. So a working man's club that doesn't have any attachment to sport other than its name need not apply. Because, you know, so, I mean, but you, you, would be, you wouldn't be surprised at some of the queries I've had. Um, there, in my opinion, this needs to be as straightforward as possible because people have had a tough enough year. So if anybody's in any doubt, they should go to Sport NI and ask for support with the guidance. Um, if they're not getting it from a government body, or if they do get it and it's not enough, maybe need more detail, go straight to Sport NI because they are primed and ready to take any queries. I mean, I got that assurance last week because that's one of the things that I asked. Mr. Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister specifically in relation to arts funding and the, the different funds that have been announced? Of the £29 million that was uh, allocated, can you, could you just update us on exactly how much has been um, allocated and how, many, how much in terms of grants have been made? Well, I, the, I don't have all that uh, information on hand, but I'd certainly write to the, to the member, but I just want to assure him. Um, that we will and have made uh, additional funding available for individuals, freelancers as well, um, because the, the, they're, they're going through an awful difficult time. They don't receive public money normally. Um, but as for the rest, the breakdown of it, um, 
and I'm not saying this to be smart, it is, the Arts Council have published it on their website, um, but certainly I'll, I'll get a breakdown of grant given under each heading, um, and I would suggest it goes to the website as well. Mr O'Toole. Thank you uh, to the Minister for that answer. Can she give us some assurance that um, all of the allocation will be got out to artists, creatives, whether they're technical. I, I've dealt with a lot of constituents who are, you know, someone, for example, who, who runs stage crew. It's a wide range of people who've been completely excluded from other schemes and they're a vital part of our creative industries. Is she confident that all that money will be got out before the end of the financial year and that people who need help will get it because some of these schemes aren't opening until the new year? Well, I, I want to assure the member, because I've heard you know, speculation, not only just about when the sports fund will be available, but when the rest of, or any of the arts fund will be available. The Arts Council have got this out to people as quickly as possible. Um, individuals in particular, some of which the feedback I've got, have said that they've been helped at the right time with the appropriate amount of money. Um, so I just want to give assurance to the member, indeed to everybody else, that it's been as open and transparent as possible and it's been supported and made easy by the staff of the Arts Council as well. Ms Gemma Dolan. Minister, in your statement on the 3rd of November, you said that you want to establish a statutory body to oversee the verification of intimidation and you wanted to see the PSNI more involved in the intimidation points system process. Can you give some more detail on how the proposals will be progressed? Well, I thank the member for her question, and that, that was one of the first questions that both Dolores Kelly and Linda Dillon raised at this question time today. I mean, first of all, we need to have a scheme that's robust and it's verified properly because intimidation points have been abused by some. And when people abuse the system, those people who are lying on sofas, four generations under one roof, but indeed, you know, some of us are sitting with constituents with over 200 points who haven't received intimidation but are sitting with that. They need support. It. We need to ensure that the system is robust and it does verify anyone's claim for intimidation points. Ms Dolan. Gormi and uh, Minister, thank you for that answer. Um, clearly, it will take time to develop new proposals. Will interim arrangements be put in place during this development phase? It will take time to develop the proposals and I, next week, will announce the fundamental review into the allocation of points, the consultation into that. Um, I will be meeting the Housing Executive along with my officials to look at next steps. I want the proposals brought forward as soon as possible, um, particularly for those who are victim to domestic abuse and violence, to ensure that they aren't further penalised as a result of the current system. This is Martina Anderson. Uh, Minister, what support has been put in place for councils like Derry and, St and Straban for loss of income in 2020-2021? Well, I've, um, I think I'm counting up to well over 85 million at this stage, um, and we're still we're still going. Uh, it's money that, first of all, is needed. It will keep the councils open. It will keep the essential functions going. But you know, the member will see in her own constituency. Um, the Council have, provide, have been the, the funding conduit to get money out around food, around essential support for the community. Um, so the Executive has completely supported that. I've met with Solace, I've met with Nilga. They are putting in more bids, I've no doubt, but this department has fully funded each of those requests. Gomi Ogids, Minister, for that answer. Um, what has been the department's decision making model that it's put in place for the income support? allocations for each council? Well, the, the model has been that, in fairness, at the first, when the first application went in, when Deirdre Hargy was here, there was a very, very strong due diligence done to ensure that whatever asks the council were putting in, they were tested by our own financial mechanisms and procedures, and they withstood that due diligence. Um, the requests are coming in based on what the council needs. And to be fair, that relationship has been respectful. It has been inclusive and it has worked. I think all of the 11 councils, the money that they put in for in my department, have received their full amount. Mr Gary Middleton, one question and one answer. Mr Gary Middleton. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I, I recently um, que uh, sent a question to the Minister around the sub-regional stadia fund. Uh, can the Minister give an indicative time frame as to when that would be expected uh, to go out? Well, the short answer is as soon as I get the final business cases. Um, but I have to say, the, my officials, Sport NI, the IFA, 
are all working very, very closely. Um, I would hope that an announcement would be made regarding the sub-regional in spring, early summer. Thank you. That concludes questions to the Minister for Communities. A point of order, Mr Paul Gibbon. Thank you, uh, Deputy Principal Speaker. Um, I would appreciate the Speaker's office to investigate the Alliance Party member for East Antrim, Stuart Dixon, who at uh, question one to the Communities Minister uh, made very serious allegations and maligned my character uh, whenever he said uh, that I had uh, sought to derail the domestic abuse bill in earlier proceedings today. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, you can confirm that it was the Justice Minister who decided not to move the further consideration stage, thus preventing this Assembly from considering that very important piece of legislation. And secondly, members will know that Chairman of Committee or Madam Chairs do not act unilaterally, and the decision in respect of that amendment was a decision supported by the SDLP, the Green Party and the Ulster Unionist Party. It also had conditional support from Sinn Féin that had the uh, Justice Minister's amendment been successful on legal aid, that they too would have supported the commencement order associated with that amendment. So to that effect, will he insist upon the member for East Antrim coming to this House, retracting his outrageous statement and apologising to me and to this House for misleading members? Thank you. Uh, standing orders 36 through to 42 deal with the procedures of the House in relation to the scheduling of bills. Uh, what the member has said uh, in terms of, I'm not getting into the, the debate, but what the member has said in terms of the legislation not being moved by the relevant minister is accurate. In relation to the comments that were made uh, by Mr Dixon, um, I would suggest the best way to proceed on this is to allow Mr Speaker to review Hansard, and I'm not calling for a basin of water, but to allow Mr Speaker to review Hansard to see if any breach did occur and to take the appropriate action arising out of that. I hope that that satisfies the member and we can now move on to the next agenda item, which is the adjournment. The Assembly is now adjourned. <laughs>